everybody it's me tim dodd the everyday astronaut Uh, i'm not in florida i'm actually going to uh watch this falcon heavy flight from right here in iowa uh tonight spacex is launching their third falcon heavy and this one is a doozy this one is like they're pushing this thing to the absolute limits i mean they're getting pretty comfortable with this vehicle pretty quickly uh so let's pop right in like always if you guys have if you're if you know of an upcoming launch you're like hey i want to know all the information about it I have a handy dandy little website called everydayastronaut.com where you can go and then you can click on pre-launch previews and you can get a rundown on exactly what's going to happen during this mission. So tonight, this is taking off uh, in 30 minutes from right now, basically. Um, This is SpaceX launching the STP-2, which is the Space Test Program 2. And uh, this is 24 experimental satellites for the U.S. Department of Defense, NASA, the NOAA, And the Planetary Society is also launching uh, LightSail 2, which is extra, extra exciting in my opinion, because that's, uh, I helped pay for that satellite as a, as a member of the Planetary Society. I actually helped literally put (laughs) a freaking satellite in space. Uh, You should definitely be a member of Planetary Society. That's Bill Nye is the CEO of that. Uh, It's, they're just awesome. They make sure they help push uh, space agenda, uh, especially politically, and make sure that we get cool things going on. So I'm a big supporter of them. Really excited to see LightSail 2 fly. It's going to be awesome. So this is, of course, SpaceX's rocket. This is, uh, that's the launch provider. The customer is actually the U.S. Department of Defense. So it's technically, uh, you know, a, a DOD launch. And this rocket is SpaceX's Falcon Heavy Block 5. 
Now here's the interesting thing, brand new core booster. So you'll see the booster is literally brand new, which we'll talk about more in a second. The side boosters have been, they're the first time that actual Falcon Heavy side boosters have been flown, because don't forget the first Falcon Heavy demo mission actually used uh, used boosters, but they weren't, they were Falcon 9 boosters. Of course, you can't have a used Falcon Heavy booster on the first Falcon Heavy flight. So they were actually pre-used Falcon 9 boosters. And now those babies are, this is the first time we're actually reusing Falcon Heavy dedicated boosters. These just flew two months ago or so. So <laughs> this is crazy. They're already ready to go, which is awesome. This is of course taking off from the only launch pad that can currently uh, accept the Falcon Heavy and currently handle the Falcon Heavy, which is Launch Complex 39A at Kennedy Space Center. This is of course where the Saturn V took off in the space shuttle. This is a very, uh, very awesome, awesome, awesome launch pad. Um, and right next door, only you know about six kilometers, four miles or so away, is LC-40, their other launch pad, and that's technically at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. So don't forget, if it says LC Launch Complex, that's at NASA, that's at Kennedy Space Center. If it's SLC, that means it's Space Launch Com Complex Center, that is at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, right next door, literally like on the same island, just with a little river basically running between the two. Okay, so this is interesting because it's only 3,700 kilograms, just over 8,000 pounds. That's well within what a Falcon 9 could easily carry. And especially because the final destination is only medium Earth orbit, so where like GPS satellites are. So you'd think, why on Earth are they using a Falcon Heavy for this easy of a mission? But uh, <laughs> um, I have to tell you, this mission is absolutely bonkers. There are uh, four burns in this, in, this, uh, in this actual mission. There's three distinct orbits. It has to change inclinations. I mean, this is this is actually a really hard to perform uh, flight path. So yeah, so so the next part is where are these spacecraft going? These are going to three different distinct orbits. Most are actually in low Earth orbit, but the actual DSX spacecraft for the United States Air Force will be deployed in medium Earth orbit, which again is where uh, GPS satellites and a, a few other types of satellites hang out. But it's not a very common orbit. Um, it's exactly halfway between uh, a geostationary orbit and Earth, where um, the satellites go overhead twice a day. Instead of processing exactly once a day where they stay stationary in the sky, a satellite will actually cross uh, by twice every day. So it's twice as fast of an, of an orbit as, as geostationary orbit. Okay, um, now here's the next part. Of course, they are attempting to recover the side boosters, which it'll be, I, I don't know if we'll ever see a Falcon Heavy fully expendable I don't know, there's not too many payloads that demand that kind of performance where everything is intentionally expended. Um, you can get a lot of performance gain, like a lot of performance gain if they were to expend the side, which is like almost 50% uh, higher payload capability um, going out to geostationary orbit if you expend the side boosters and the center core. If you expend the entire rocket, it's a substantially more, more capable rocket. I don't think we'll almost ever, ever, ever see it fly like that it kind of defeats the purpose of the vehicle. Um, and hopefully by the time, I'm guessing at this point, if a customer is like, hey, we want to do an expendable launch because we have, I don't know, a 60 ton satellite that needs to go to LEO, uh, which would put it in full expendable mode. I'm guessing SpaceX would try to talk them into a Starship flight. Um, so we'll see. Anyway, uh, t tangent there. These boosters will be landing at LZ-1 and 2 like they have in the past. The, the past two Falcon Heavy ones have landed down there. And the third one will be landing downrange. Ooh, we have this already to go sweet that's good news um i'll make sure it's kind of nice and quiet but i will listen in i'll try to finish up my pre-launch preview here they are attempting to recover the center core this center core is going to be 12 over 1200 kilometers downrange that's going to be blistering fast it's also setting some altitude records so people are speculating trying to figure out it looks like the first stage is actually or the core stage is actually going to coast up to about 200 kilometers which is substantially higher and the way that that, that affects a vehicle launching. Um, if you stay nice and shallow, uh, you can kind of use the atmosphere longer. You, you go, you drag through the atmosphere for a longer amount of time. So the atmosphere doesn't hit, smack the vehicle as hard. If the vehicle's coming up and coming back down, think about like, think about if you were on a boat and you jumped out of the boat going, you know, really quickly and you'd kind of tumble along the top of the water versus jumping off of a cliff and you just smack that water. That's kind of what the core booster is going to be doing. It's going to be going up and it's going to be so much higher and so stinking fast because it it's, has so much velocity. It's going to hit the atmosphere at record-breaking speeds, um, and it's going to be quite, quite, quite substantial. But um, it will do a, have to do a really hefty entry burn to make sure it doesn't uh, 
burn up and explode. So I'm really excited. Hopefully we, they don't lose this one. Um, but the, the other part is they're also trying to recover the fairings on this thing, which is unbelievable. So this is the trifecta. If they catch, oh, and another thing, remember how the last Falcon Heavy launch, they did land the center core and then it ended up, it's the only booster they've lost at the sea where it actually tipped over uh, and, and was lost once it had successfully landed. Um, they have now fixed the the um, of course it's still or the uh, the Roomba the Octograbber, um, and it is able to now go out and grab onto the Falcon Heavy center core. That's something that did was not capable on the last one. They they had slightly different fixtures that hold onto the vehicles because the Falcon Heavy is different how how it has to hold on to the side cores. This center core uh, and now they, they changed out the fixtures that actually hold onto the core so it can grab onto the center core for this flight. So. Assuming it lands, hopefully this time uh, the Octagrabber is going to be able to grab it, no problem, and that should be freaking awesome. Um, so yeah, so <laughs> if they do all this stuff, this will be the third flight of Falcon Heavy, eighth mission for the year, so not as busy of a year as last year, um, but it's going to be the 42nd, 43rd, and 44th booster landed. Holy cow. Uh, yeah. So, and of course we have this graphic from Jeff Barrett. And this article is written up by John Eric, John Rumpf, and uh, or John, yeah, John Rumpf. And thank you, John, for always staying on top of these. He does an awesome job. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm excited. This is going to be like the ultimate mission. I do want to show you some pictures quick. Um, look at this. So of course they are using, like I said, a brand new center core, uh, which. Yeah, the and they were planning to do that anyway. So this did not affect the fact that they lost the last center core did not affect this launch in any way. They were already planning to use a center a brand new center core, probably because they haven't ever reused a center core. They wanted to probably give it a real heavy, you know, one over, make sure that uh, center core it is a slightly, you know, although it looks the same, it is a slightly different vehicle, has different fixtures, has different attachment points, has different structural loads, has a different inner stage. You know, there's things that they would have to do to to make sure that it's checked out and ready for the next flight. They weren't just gonna take the one from the from um, the Arabsat 6A mission uh, and just, you know, although they are, were comfortable with the side boosters doing that, but the center core is a little different. They don't have anything to really go off of since they've never recovered a center booster. So yeah, I just think this is so cool. The toasty side boosters just looks freaking, freaking awesome. Um, yeah, man, I just love it. So uh, everything's looking good. Oh, look at, uh, I, it's yeah, I love this vehicle. So um, we also learned a few more things. Yeah, Elon was talking about uh, how the, he called them droids. The droids can now hold down the center core. Um, <laughs> so they they like I said they did change out the the handholds or the the hold down clamps to make it capable of holding down. So yeah, and I want them to replace Octagrabber with like eight Boston Dynamic robots and then make them look like C three PO. It's just my idea. Maybe that's a dumb idea, but I'm ugh, I'm super stoked for this. So let's just kind of put this up here and, and wait for the launch to happen. Um, I'm going to answer a few of you guys' questions. Um, and thank you guys already for tuning in tonight. It's it's a late one here for me. It might be a late one for a lot of you or a, lot, or a really early one for some of you too. Um, so, wow. Oh, God. <laughs> I can't even keep up. But thank you, Michael, Sven, Soldier of the Ark, Enchantment, uh, Peter. Thank you, BL. Uh, Schmid, a new member. Thank you, Cass. Thank you, uh, Kindle, Soldier of the Ark. Can we get a shout out for the Team Light Sale? Yes, absolutely. Team Light Sale. Uh, I'll talk about that probably in between. We might have a lot of downtime, and I don't know how late I'm going to stay up for it. We'll see. Um, but we have a lot to talk about. So I'm going to tune in because this is a, a dense mission. Oh, I love all this footage. Yes. <laughs> uh, we just have a lot to learn here, so I'm going to be tuning in carefully. You're looking at a live view of the Falcon Heavy on historic launch pad 39A at Kennedy Space Center awaiting liftoff at 2.30 a.m. local time. Welcome to our live webcast of the Falcon Heavy Space Test Program 2 mission, or STP-2, from SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. My name is Alex Siegel, and I'm a material planner here at SpaceX. I'm excited to be here with you today, along with my co-hosts, bringing you coverage of the third launch, launch of Falcon Heavy, this one for the U.S. Air Force. And I'm Jesse Anderson. I'm a lead manufacturing engineer here at SpaceX. 
Tonight's mission is a rideshare mission and marks the first Department of Defense launch on Falcon Heavy, the world's most powerful operational rocket by a factor of two. It will be among the most challenging launches in SpaceX history. We will be delivering 24 satellites to space with 20 distinct separation events for 13 partners. There will be four separate upper stage MVAC-D engine burns, three separate deployment orbits, a final propulsive passivation maneuver, and a total mission duration of over six hours. But, but that's not all. As with our previous Falcon Heavy missions, our three boosters will undergo three separation events and three landing attempts. There will be a lot of activity happening all at once over the course of the next four hours as we deploy all 24 payloads. It's also worth noting that tonight's mission will be our longest satellite launch to date, with a total duration of over six hours, as Jesse just mentioned. We are pushing the capabilities of Falcon Heaven this evening to demonstrate the vehicle's full potential, which is why it's longer than normal. The launch window this evening is four hours long, and we are currently tracking towards the end of that window. If we're unable to launch tonight, our backup window opens up tomorrow, Tuesday, June 25th, at the same time. We're currently at T-minus 17 minutes and counting, and all systems are go at Kennedy Space Center. Let's take a closer look at the rocket. Falcon Heavy is essential, essentially three Falcon 9 rockets strapped together, which means it can carry a much larger payload, on not only to Earth orbit, but to the Moon and Mars. Like Falcon 9, Falcon Heavy is a two-stage launch vehicle. The big difference is that the Falcon Heavy's first stage is comprised of three cores and the Falcon 9 only has one. Each one of these cores has nine Merlin 1D engines, making for a total of 27 overall. Altogether, the engines produce five million pounds of thrust, equal to 18 747s at takeoff. In fact, the engines produce so much power that we don't run them all at full thrust all at once until after liftoff. For the mission today, the center core is brand new, but the two side boosters were previously flown in April on Arabsat 6A HELP Falcon Heavy mission. This is the first Department of Defense launch flying reused boosters. Now, during ascent, Falcon Heavy will throttle its thrust up and down and on both side boosters in the center core to balance aerodynamic and structural loads on the vehicle. About 70% through the first stage's burn, the two side boosters will separate and come back to Earth for simultaneous landings at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station on Landing Zone 1 and Landing Zone 2. At this point, the mission will proceed just like a standard Falcon 9 flight. The center core will keep firing for another minute, then will perform a standard stage separation from the second stage. We will attempt to land the center core on our drone ship, Of Course I Still Love You which is currently stationed about 650 nautical miles off the coast of Florida in the Atlantic Ocean. It's worth mentioning that for this mission, bringing back the center core will be more challenging than usual, as our booster will be coming in extra hot, and our drone ship is positioned almost double the normal distance from land. Given this distance, we may not receive any video of landing. Now, if we are able to land all three cores tonight, it will be a particularly exciting achievement. The second stage is exactly the same as any other Falcon 9 flight. Tonight, the second stage will move through four different orbits in order to deliver the payloads on this mission. The first and second are low Earth orbit, or LEO. The third is a transfer orbit, and the final is medium Earth orbit, or MEO. Speaking of those satellites, all 24 of them are safely enclosed inside of the 17-foot diameter payload fairing, which is the pointed structure on the very top of the rocket. This protects the payload from aerothermal loads, heating, and contamination during ascent. Once we reach the vacuum of space, we no longer need them, so we will jettison the fairing as the second stage continues on its journey to orbit. We will be attempting to recover the fairing pieces tonight with our recovery vessel, Miss Tree, formerly known as Mr. Steven. Our hope is to catch one of the fairing pieces in the ship's nets and recover the other piece from the water. If we are not successful with our catch attempt, Miss Tree will recover both pieces from the water. Let's check in on how the countdown is going. It's T minus 14 yes. minutes, 10 seconds and counting down. Good evening. Yes. I'm John Isperker, the Falcon Principal Integration Engineer at SpaceX. Now we are at T minus 14 minutes from the launch of the Falcon Heavy and all systems are go for launch on the half hour. Falcon Heavy rolled out to the pad with the payload 27 hours ago and went vertical about seven hours later. 
Now we did have a ground hydraulic issue early in the count, but it was fixed and currently everything is go. We cleared the pad deck at T minus nine hours to begin hazardous operations. And just before we began the webcast, the SpaceX launch director pulled the nine members of the launch team. You can see the, you can see the firing room at Kennedy Space Center. We pulled the team, got a go for propellant loading and launch. Now we're currently loading propellant on all three first stage boosters and the second stage. Now we load two propellants on the Falcon Heavy. One is liquid oxygen called LOX. No oxygen is in space to support combustion, so we have to bring our own. We chill it to get it as dense as we can in order to maximize how much we load. The second propellant is our fuel, RP-1. That's essentially a purified kerosene. Now these two propellants have a long history of usage. The Saturn V first stage flown from this very pad on the moon missions 50 years ago used LOX and kerosene. Now for the satellites on tonight's flight, everything is go. The last transfer to internal power is coming up in just half a minute. Other than that, the spacecraft teams here at the Cape are monitoring data as we proceed to T0. And I expect a lot of satellite builders and operators are, are anticipating getting data from space with a lot of enthusiasm. Now we're launching out of the Eastern Range supported by Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. The range is currently go. They're prepared to support today's mission. They're making sure that the sea space, the airspace is cleared. No one's nearby to get in the way of tonight's launch. They're also releasing balloons, which brings up the question of how's the weather? The good news is the weather is looking very good. Ground level winds are acceptable. Upper altitude winds are also acceptable. Now, as Alex mentioned, we started the day with a four hour window. However, now that we are into locks loading, we don't have the ability to hold the countdown. Falcon Heavy is three rockets counting down at the same time. We need so much liquid oxygen that we would have to scrub tonight in order to use the backup date tomorrow at the same opening of the window time, 11.30 p.m. Eastern. Now, if you followed the SpaceX webcast in the past, you've probably heard me remind everyone that launch is hard. Well, that goes double tonight, as we're going to fly the most demanding mission profile for a Falcon rocket ever. So the SpaceX team has their conservative dial set at 11 and stands <laughs> ready to take time to look into anything out of the norm. Now, as the energy from the team gathering below me outside of the control center is growing, we are go at T minus 10 minutes and 51 seconds. <sighs> As we mentioned earlier, tonight's launch is for the U.S. Air Force and is a rideshare mission with 24 satellites. The mission involves the largest number of government agencies we've had as mission partners, including the Air Force, the Naval Academy, NASA, NOAA, and the Taiwan Space Agency. The specific agency inside the Air Force responsible for overseeing tonight's mission is the Space and Missile Systems Center, or SMC. Let's get some more details about what the agency does and is responsible for. Hey, I really quick need to make just a really, really quick comment. Uh, if you are commenting on, uh, f in this particular case, a female presenter's appearance, please keep those comments to yourself, even if you think she's lovely and attractive. Uh, why don't we just focus on her brilliance and the other presenter's uh, intelligence instead of pointing out uh, immature things. So please grow up and leave those comments to yourself. Uh, we're here to be excited about aerospace, aerospace engineering, the people putting this stuff into space, and not make lewd comments uh, that are in incredibly inappropriate. Just please uh, keep that in mind. So let's learn here though, sorry. And service capabilities, field cutting edge rocket systems modernize the United States satellite control structure, create never before seen technology, and deliver sustained, unrivaled space superiority for our nation. Let's face it, the world's changing. Along with it, SMC is changing to ensure the United States remains the vanguard of space capability and scientific understanding. We dubbed our aggressive and innovative new approach to the way we work, SMC 2.0. That means speed to quickly implement the best solutions to new problems. Partnerships to forge the relationships necessary for the mutual benefit of the U.S. and our international allies. Innovation to capitalize on the most advanced cutting edge technology in the world. 
culture to inspire the necessary risk-taking that will propel us into the future. And Enterprise, to share our vision of accelerated and affordable space systems for the Department of Defense. Initially founded in 1954 to develop the first intercontinental ballistic missile, SMC has produced unprecedented and unparalleled national defense space technology for over 60 years. During this time, we've been called upon to support manned space, anti-satellite, and missile defense programs while continuously increasing our space capability. That's where we came from. But a more important question is, where are we going? Humans have always been explorers. We venture to discover that which is unknown. At SMC, we push the boundaries of the known and fight every single day to enhance our technological capabilities, launching past the limits of the sky. We are the pathfinders to the high frontier, and we are building the future of space. Sweet. The SpaceX team continues to count down for launch for the nighttime launch of Falcon Heavy. I remember watching the night launch of Saturn V on the Apollo 17 mission in December 1972, and it turned night into day. We're expecting the same tonight from 27 Merlin engines. We're currently at T-minus 7 minutes, 28 seconds and counting. Fuel loading is continuing. We're about to wrap up fuel loading on the three first stage boosters over the next minute. Liquid oxygen loading is continuing. That'll wrap up between three and two minutes before liftoff on all the stages. We've had the report the last satellite has gone on internal power just a moment ago. Everything's looking good on the satellites. Now a major activity coming up here in another two and a half minutes is retract of the strongback. We'll see the clamps open up around the second stage. The strongback will recline about two degrees in preparation for launch. We're also just inside T-minus seven minutes. We've begun chilling in the 27 Merlin 1D engines. Now a lot's going to happen in the first four minutes of flight of the Falcon Heavy. We'll first light the two side boosters and then the center core. The flight computer on Falcon Heavy will check the power on all the engines, then command release from the ground hold downs at T0, so we lift off at T minus zero. Right after we lift off, we're at full power of over 5.1 million pounds of thrust. 40 seconds into flight, we decrease power on the two side boosters in preparation for maximum aerodynamic loads on the vehicle. Once we get through this period, Falcon Heavy will throttle back up to power on the two side boosters. We now are two minutes into flight and we're again reducing thrust on the two side boosters. This time it's to decrease forces on the rocket structure, especially that structure that holds the side boosters to the center core. The acceleration is building every second as we burn propellant and we're lightening the rocket. So we need to throttle down the side boosters by physically turning off engines to keep the loads below the maximum allowable. Two and a half minutes into flight, we fully turn off the side boosters, called BECO, Booster Engine Cutoff. Beco. Then we'll use high pressure gas separation system that's mounted on the top and bottom of the center core. That'll unlock the two side boosters and push them away. Now once we clear the side boosters, the center core will throttle up to full power and burn another minute. Finally, at just past three and a half minutes after liftoff, the center core shuts down, main engine cut off, and the second stage separates. Now from this point on, it's like a Falcon 9 mission, other than we do happen to have three first stage rockets returning to Earth at both Cape Canaveral and the drone ship. Meanwhile, on the way into orbit, the fairing will separate, the second stage engine will undergo a series of four burns eventually delivering all 24 satellites to their intended orbits. Now it's a demanding sequence of events for the Falcon Heavy tonight. But from this point on, everything is looking good. We're at four and a half minutes. We're getting ready to recline the strongback. So let's watch and listen to the final countdown. Yes. Ugh, I don't know why I'm like extra extra nervous for this one just because it's it is such a demanding mission uh and here's our friendly reminder it must not be windy at all there must be almost no ground winds because of how uh, static the the uh condensation is there around the rocket this is the reminder that the reason there's so much condensation is the same reason like when you open up a refrigerator or something on a really humid day or uh why uh 
what's that called? That, that ice stuff that's like extra ice, more ice, dry ice. There we go. Uh, why it like looks like there's always clouds coming off. It's because it's so cold that the liquid in the air comes in contact with it and turns into condensation. And the liquid f oxygen in this vehicle is unbelievably cold. It's almost 200 degrees, minus 200 degrees Celsius. So if you went up and touched this rocket right now, your hand would stick to it and you would have like instant frostbite. And when the humid Florida air comes in contact with any of that, uh, any of that, not only the, the skin of the rocket, but also you can see uh, oxygen purging there from the second stage, uh, that turns the air into, into uh, condensation clouds. And it looks as super ominous tonight just because there's such little wind, it's not blowing it away. And that's, uh, I think that's extra cool. It's like, it's Chocolate alive, it's literally down. breathing, it's, it's taking it. I don't know, I just think that's awesome. Um, we have so much to talk about that we'll, we'll talk about during the coast phase, because there's going to be a lot of coast phases. So and we will be doing a lot of uh, your questions here. So thank you guys so much for, for joining. Um, okay, so Clyde, thank you. Grant, thank you. Uh, Dylan, thank you for everything. It is a late night for me, but it's not as late for the people out there at Mission Control. We should talk about that real quick, that they do have that new Mission Control, the firing room, which is actually, that firing room is literally like attached to the vehicle assembly building. And it's the same firing room where the Saturn V and, uh, you know, all those Saturn V shuttle, uh, it's that same firing room. And the funny thing is the, the firing room used to face away where on internal power. their backs were facing the rocket and they finally flipped it so that looking out those giant there's huge windows and now finally the the crew as they're looking out uh, out of those windows you can see they can watch the launch although they should be probably looking at their monitors but uh i just think it's super cool that they they have a firing room now and on kennedy two locks load is closed out at, at nasa kennedy space center their old firing room which they still have and i don't know if it's a backup or what is literally just this tiny little, it looks like a dentist office, almost right at the entrance of the Air Force Base. Tiny little place. Um, and now they have this grand and beautiful firing room, which um, which is pretty exciting, especially as we get ramped up for, I think the first mission that used that was uh, the DM-1 Crew Dragon Flight. And I should probably, while we talk about that, people ask me all the time, why aren't we hearing updates? Uh, just like any investigation, guys, you don't really hear updates until the conclusion is out. You know, you don't hear about uh, let's just say, uh, I don't know, uh, some kind of big accident until, you know, the, the investigators have gone through, like, you know, if an airplane crashes or something, they go through and they collect all the data and they write up a report and they get extremely thorough with it until they have all of the answers and then they let us know. And that's the same thing here with both NASA and SpaceX, um, who are Got looking into, complete. um, what's going on here with that. So, and the vehicles will start up. yeah, all right. We are only 50 seconds away, guys. Oh, who is everyone else? I'm like extra excited for this one. I the first night launch for Falcon Heavy, so we're gonna have some awesome pictures. Go for launch. Um, we are also going to have, um, uh, what else? Oh yeah, the the downrange landing, guys. I'm really nervous slash excited for this one. Whew. T minus thirty seconds. Here we go. Okay. Here we go. Guys. 15, 15 seconds. Here we go. I don't know what this is. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Yes. Yes. Oh. Okay. Yes. There we go. You can already see the center core throttle down. Look at how the center core's flame is not as long as the side core's already. Just almost 25 seconds into flight under the thrust of over 5 million pounds. Falcon Heavy is headed to space. We're getting ready to throttle down for passing through the period of maximum dynamic pressure. Yes. First night launch. We've heard call out of throttle bucket no, for sidecar. We're through max Q. <laughs> Not tonight. Don't you do that. Wow. So yeah, just a friendly reminder. 
Uh, Everything continuing to look good on the Merlin 1D engines. We're throttling back up on the side boosters to full power. So 5 million pounds of thrust, the Saturn V had 7.5. 15 seconds into flight, performance looks nominal. So it's pretty darn close, two thirds of the Saturn V and total thrust output. And of course, the center core throttles down uh, as much as it can. Currently, the next event coming up in about two minutes, we'll hear call out of chillin' of the MVAC-D engine. That allows liquid oxygen to the top of the turbo pump to get the second stage engine ready to chill for ignition. Just a couple of minutes. Don't do this, don't do this to me. Um, yes, the Falcon Heavy has a roll program. You can tell it's going to li it lines itself up pretty parallel to the horizon. We're two minutes into flight. We've begun to decrease thrust on the side boosters to minimize acceleration and loads on the Falcon Heavy structure. We've turned off one engine on each of the side boosters to decrease that load. Now our next major event coming up here in about 10 seconds, <laughs> shutdown and separation of the side boosters. Did you just say they turn off an engine on the side boosters to decrease the load? I've never heard that before. Is that the view saying? should be the side booster cameras on two sides and the center core in the middle. Booster shut down. Okay. Yes. Separation. Good separation. That's a big one still. Over the cheering in the background. It's going on midnight, but a lot of people here at SpaceX. Side boosters have separated. They're getting ready for their burn back to Cape Canaveral. You can see on the left and right views, the side boosters have ignited. The center core continues under full power. Everything looking good on the Falcon Heavy. Next event coming up in about 15 seconds will be shutdown of the center core, followed by stage separation and ignition of the second stage engine. Look at those plume interactions. Good views of the two side boosters under the thrust of three ends in each slowing down their velocity and coming back towards Cape Canaveral. Wow, that's gorgeous. We have shut down on the center core. Go. Stage separation confirmed. Yes, yes. Okay, second stage, you got a lot of work to do. You got a lot of work to do. We have successful separation and ignition. We're coming up on shutdown of the two side boosters. Side booster, boost back shutdown. And we've heard the call out <laughs> side booster, boost back shutdown. The center core you can see is not doing a boost back. It's headed downrange to the drone ship. Very Here comes fair. fairing booster, separation. Yes. Fairing separation. We have confirmation of the payload fairing separation. So, so far, four minutes, 17 seconds into flight. Second stage looking good, headed to low Earth orbit, carrying the 24 satellites. The side boosters have done their first boon, coming back to Cape Canaveral. The center core has separated and is beginning its long coast downrange to the drone ship in the Atlantic Ocean. So at four minutes, 35 seconds and counting, everything looking good on Falcon Heavy. Uh, Elon gave the center core landing only a 50% chance because it's so extra spicy. It's going to be crazy so big time <laughs> i hope that it, it works out uh they're just really riding the edge of the performance of that booster oh man now those side boosters are making their way back their grid fins on all three boosters should be deployed and those are help guiding them to their landing zones as a reminder today we will be attempting to, to recover all three of these first stages and all three boosters are currently making their way home. In just a few minutes, the side boosters will execute an entry burn followed by a landing burn, and the center core will, do the com will complete the same burns just a few minutes later. Both burns are used to slow the stage's speed down rapidly before landing. At the time of separation, the side boosters were traveling slow enough to turn around and make their way back to land at our side-by-side -side landing pads. The center core is going too fast to efficiently return to the Cape, so we're using our autonomous drone ship, of course I still love you, as we mentioned earlier. As a reminder, our drone ship is positioned twice as far offshore than normal, so we may not get visuals of landing tonight. 
Also coming up in a few minutes will be the call out for second engine cutoff. So coming up in about a minute here, we're going to look for that side, burst, side booster re-entry burn to begin. Shortly after that, that should end about 20 seconds later. Dang. <laughs> you can see both of those boosters on the infrared camera on the left side of your screen. I cannot wait for to see the, uh, the dual streak images from my photographer friends. There's going to be unbelievable images from tonight's launch. That's one reason I really wish I, I would have made it down tonight, just for those streak shots. Oh, it's going to be nuts. Again, about 30 seconds until we expect those side boosters entry burn to begin. So keep an eye on the left side of your screen. It's amazing they can track them like that. Technically a triple streak, you're right, because it'll be, yeah, the, the take off and then the two landing. Yeah. It's In going about to be, 10 seconds, we, we should go. see those side boosters reignite for their entry burn. Side booster entry burn startup. Here we go. And we have confirmation that the entry burn has begun. And in about 15 seconds from now, we expect that to end. Oh, that oh, is wow. pretty. There's those you, you center core, for, center engine, and then two side engines is what we saw there. You hear the crowd cheer behind me. That and gorgeous. that entry burn has completed. Note that second engine cutoff and the center core will be landing almost at the same time. So we're going to have a few events in succession at about T plus 8 minutes and 21 seconds. Oh, you can start to Both see the booster. booster. FTS is safe. You can tell it's kind of drifting. They, they come back in, they give it some angle Stage attack. Stage 2 FTS Operative is safe. So you'll see some... In about 20 seconds, oh, we're going to look for that cool. side booster landing burn to begin on both boosters. Side booster is transonic. Oh, that is so cool. About 10 seconds away. <laughs> oh, that is unbelievable. Side booster landing burn startup. Here we go. We've heard the call out for side booster landing burn startup, and there you see it on your screen. There's one, there's two. See it coming towards our two landing pads. Look at him there. See those landing legs deploy. Incredible. Confirm side booster landing. What an iconic view. And also, at the same time, I believe we've had second engine cutoff at the same time. I love that. <laughs> that is the coolest thing. Oh, look at that. As we mentioned <sighs> earlier, the center core entry and landing is going to be risky. During entry, it'll face more heating and dynamic pressure than we've ever experienced on Falcon 9 or heavy flight before. Why, you ask? because we have to lift the second stage higher and faster than other Falcon Heavy flights in order to have enough performance in it to execute four burns into all the different orbits. So coming up at T plus 9 minutes and 39 seconds, we should see the center core entry burn ending. Center core entry burn. Oh, we have the confirmation. <laughs> Looks like that was the confirmation for it to begin. Yeah. So we're a little bit off the timeline. Center core entry burn shut down. And we had just heard the confirmation that center core entry burn has shut down. And now that the entry burn is complete, the center core is moving back about 20% faster than it was at the end of the Falcon Heavy 2 Arabsat entry burn. First stage KPL is expected. Now we're coming up, we're just about a minute away from that center core landing burn beginning. And as we've been mentioning, Durant this ship, will be the most difficult landing that we've had to date. Drone ship AOS, so that means this will be a three-engine burn. That center, sonic. that center engine will start up first, and then two outer engines will start up as well for that landing burn. They still have telemetry, so that's good. And we're just 30 seconds away from that center core landing, and it's no surprise that we do not have a live view of that center core as it's coming down. But it looks like we got a live view of the center drone ship the there. Of course, I still love you. Okay, so it's subsonic now. Here we go, guys. <sighs> if they land this. If you're just now tuning in, we're just about 10 seconds away from that center core landing burn beginning.
Come on, baby. Stage one landing burn has started. And we have confirmation that the center core landing burn has begun. Let's see that coming down on Of Course I Still Love You. Got a pretty good view. <laughs> and as you can see on our screen, it looks like our center core did not make it on our drone ship, Of Course I Still Love You tonight. Again, as we've been mentioning, this was the most challenging landing that we've had to date. And this is, this is our secondary mission. So our primary mission, we just heard the call out for a good orbit of our second stage. So we are actually just moments away from our first deployment of the evening for Oculus ASR, which was developed by students at Michigan Technological University. We will be passing beyond the Bermuda ground station, so there is a chance that telemetry may cut out a few seconds before deployment, in which case we won't be able to see the satellite actually deploy on camera or get confirmation of a successful deployment until telemetry is restored. And we're just about 30 seconds away from that deployment. So we'll listen into the nets for that confirmation. So I'm, I cannot wait for the rundown on what, on what exactly went wrong. This is the third time they've only landed, the second time they did land it, but it did not return home uh, for these, these center cores. The first time they did not land because of a, um, how the T-TEB, uh, the, the ignition fluid, actually swaps tanks mid, uh, if it runs out, it has a switch for another one. We still have that live view. Might have a chance to see this deployment live on camera. <sighs> At least it didn't hit the ship. <laughs> they don't have to refurbish it now. Again, we are Man. waiting for the Oculus satellite deployment. Man. And as we expected, looks like we lost that live view. So we will wait to get some confirmation of that deployment and we will update you guys uh, in a few minutes later on in the webcast. We are now in between ground stations for the next few minutes with nothing to see. <laughs> so we are going to take a quick break, but we will be leaving you with an animation that shows you where we are throughout the coast phase. We will be back around T plus 20 minutes for our next set of deployments. And it's worth noting that since we won't acquire ground station Plus, coverage again until T plus 21 minutes, we are going to miss that first P pod one CubeSat deployment. See you back here in about six minutes. Okay, so keep an eye on that timer for me guys. I'm gonna pull this up. I wanna look back at this real quick while we're at it here. Um, let's do a little review and see if we can't. All right. Oh, so don't forget, first off, before we watch this, let's set a positive tone because uh, f this was the furthest downrange, fastest fastest core recover every 20% faster than the Arab 6, six mission. And don't forget, when you're going faster the atmosphere, uh, your entry heating goes up by velocity cubed, not squared, cubed. So if you say you double your velocity, uh, you don't go four times heating. You actually increase your heat by 16 times. So going up by 20% is a substantial difference. It's heating cubed. So I don't have any knowledge, of, obviously, about what actually happened to the center core just now. Um, but the reason why it was such a, a high-risk mission is probably because they were just riding the margins so close. They had to do such conservative entry burns to have enough fuel to be able to do a landing burn. You know, at, at this margin, it, who knows what's left over. So let's take a look and see if um, it did look like the landing leg was, landing burn was coming in kind of sideways. Here we go. And we have confirmation that the center core landing burn has begun. Okay. Let's see that coming down on, of course, I still love you. Oh! It's fully sideways. You can see it's landing legs, I think. I don't want to start rumors, but these look like it's landing legs, which would mean it's like pitched over 90 degrees. It looks like it to me. Those could be lens flares. I don't want to start rumors here. I'm just totally willy-nilly speculating here. Um, but if that's the case, what could have happened, it does a three-engine landing burn most likely on, on a mission that's this, that's this close, which means three of those nine engines um, are need to light up. So if say one of them goes out, say a side engine goes out, it's going to totally pitch it over. Um, so maybe there's a small chance that that's what happened. I have no idea. Cause it flies away in a hurry. It flies away in a hurry. 
I gotta ask Elon about this. We're just gonna watch this on repeat. That's wow. Hang on, I gotta I gotta watch this again. That is unbelievable. <laughs> that is crazy. Wow. I'll try slowing it down quick. That's. guys <laughs> okay I'm gonna speed it back up that is I I really want to get this tweet out here so I'm just gonna let you guys watch this like a few more times that is crazy I can't believe that Oh crap, I can't get into Finder yet. Hold on guys, I have to pop into something here real quick and send this video over to myself quick. That was crazy. That was... Hey, the curse does continue for now. They'll get it figured out. Uh, I love seeing this kind of stuff, and I cannot wait to see what actually happened, you know, to get the actual rundown on this. Because um, knowing Elon, they will probably have it back to us in a second. Let's, let's get back to the actual stream here so that I don't accidentally miss anything. And let's see here. Make sure I'm timed up here okay okay I'm gonna do this I'm gonna let you guys look at this for a second I'm gonna get this tweet out here real, real quick and see if we can't get an answer on this Okay. Let's see how we do. Um, remember how I was talking about we we're probably going to have a oh, perfect STP 2 Falcon Heavy mission. We're T plus 20 minutes and seven seconds and counting. Right now, as we left the webcast, we were waiting to see the Oculus satellite deploy. We didn't have confirmation when we lost signal over Bermuda. That was normal, losing signal. You do it when you pass beyond line of sight. We also should have had a minute and a half or so ago, the first P-Pod, number one, open up and deploy two CubeSats for the Naval Research Laboratory. But we're waiting until we reacquire signal over the Ascension Island tracking station around the equator in the middle of the Atlantic so that we can understand whether or not the Oculus satellite deployed and how P-Pod 1 uh, deployed also. While we're waiting for acquisition of signal from Ascension, just to recap, we had a great launch of Falcon Heavy. 
The two side boosters did their choreographed landing at landing zones one and two. The center core, as you heard from the people confirmed. and may have seen a shot on Keep the screen, uh, missed the drone ship. We knew this was going to be the toughest re-entry. We are getting data back, so the team will understand over the next uh, hours and days how things have gone. It looks like now we're beginning to reacquire signal over Ascension Island. We're waiting to hear a call out how the first two satellite deploys have gone. Mm. It appears we have confirmation that the Oculus satellite was separated and P-Pod number one opened up deploying the Naval Research Laboratory satellites. There's a view from space, and if you remember the view just before we left, on the bottom left was the Oculus satellite, had a white coloring to it, and it's no longer there. Now we're gonna cover the last of the eight Peapod satellites that are coming up for deployment, and that's gonna take about uh, 30 minutes to get through this sequence. The next deployment comes up just before T plus 25 minutes. Now these eight deployers will open and that'll release 11 satellites. Now if you've watched our coverage from other launches like Iridium, you know that the one camera we have on top of the payload attach fitting cannot see all sides of the dispenser holding the satellites. Because of the positioning right there as you see on your screen of the one camera, we won't be able to see all of the CubeSat deployments today. In particular, the next three P-Pods, two, three, and four on the back side, we won't be able to pick those up. However, as the second stage does maneuver in orbit, in the sunlight, we might be able to pick up a, a glint of the sun off of the CubeSats as they move away from the second stage. Now the next deployment coming up just before 25 minutes is known as FalconSat 7. This is an optical telescope for the United States Air Force Academy. The CubeSat, when it is ejected, will eventually deploy a rigid boom that holds a membrane that acts like a lens in a telescope. And once that membrane is rigid, it will allow imaging of the sun. So this is a deployable optical telescope for the Air Force Academy. However, as I said, we won't be able to see it. We'll have to wait for call out to confirm the separation. I wish they had a ground track station there. Um, I saw someone really quickly asking about what's the difference between a closed and open cycle position of signal. engine. I have a 50 minute long video about that, so if you want to know We've the real answer. We've heard a call out, Gabon has acquisition of signal. As we are approaching the African coastline, the next ground station beyond Ascension Island is picking up the signal from Falcon Heavy second stage. Oh man, that landing. Well, we don't have any word on the fairing yet, for those of you asking. Although they were attempting to recover both of them, so maybe we'll get an update on that. Coming up on deployment in about five seconds. Dang. I don't know if that diversion was intentional or not. That was crazy. Just <laughs> P-Pod 2 deploy confirmed. And there's the call out from the avionics engineer. Always a little bit tense as you're waiting for them to confirm that the signal indicates that the door is open. Inside of each of the deployers is a spring that pushes out the CubeSats. And what we have is confirmation that the Air Force Academy deployable optical telescope should be in orbit on its own now. Now we've got about 235 seconds until we get to the next deployment. So crazy.
So yeah, I, I think my big question at this point is, uh, is was that an intentional divert, or was it a, uh, or was it you know something going wrong at the time? It did look like if it's coming in that fast, and it pitched over. I don't know if it would like. Okay, so if it's going in too fast, if you cut an engine, you're just going to end up going straight pretty much where you are. You might pitch over a little bit. Total speculation. Total. Don't don't put a word on this. I almost wonder if it actually stopped too fast and was sitting on the deck and or way above the deck, and then did like a suicide burn too early because it does have to do a full blown hardcore stop. Three. That's total speculation. I don't know because I'm actually trying to figure out how it would have the ability to to basically slow down. It's because the vertical velocity appeared to be going pretty slow, and then all of a sudden it like pitches off. Although a lot of that could be perspective. Don't forget, perspective plays into a lot, and it can play a lot of tricks on us. I just realized the music's really loud. But oh man, that was just so nuts. Oh man, I can't wait to hear, but we need to talk about, look at how many stinking satellites this thing is deploying tonight um, into very different orbits. So that's pretty awesome. Uh, one of my favorite satellites is the LightSail 2, which is Planetary Society's satellite uh, is, is launching tonight. They launched one, up just about, a oh, the third -pod opening. about four and years ago. It's known as Armadillo from the University of Texas. Now, Armadillo is an acronym, and bear with me. It stands for Atmospheric Related Measurements and Detection of Submillimeter Objects. Quite a mouthful. Primary goal is to use a dust detector to characterize the space debris environment, focusing on submillimeter debris that can't be seen by Earth-based telescopes. Now, this satellite deployer is mounted on the opposite side of the dispenser so again we'll only have verbal call out when it separates man it's funny that the used boosters have so far been the most reliable part speaks highly for reusability but again 50 percent odds of success you know that's yeah Wow, that. Let's see it. Let's see the pee pod. Pee pod three deploy confirmed. And confirmation. Pee pod number three has opened. Armadillo should be on its way into orbit in the vacuum of space. Next up will be a quick turnaround. Only about 145 seconds until we get to the next deployment. And really quick, I want to check this out. Um, I want to see, this is that triple, triple landing burn here real quick. My friend John Krause shared a nice link with me. Um, I want to ch just check this out really quick. Hang on. One second. Okay, Pew. check this out. This is gorgeous. I knew it'd be cool. I knew it'd be cool. Look at that. So you can see the launch, and then stage separation, engine cutoff around here. Okay, we're just over 50 seconds Hold away on. from the deployment of Peapod 4. This time we're going to have two CubeSats coming out of the deployer. Again, it's on the back side of the dispenser. This is the last one on the back side of the Peapods. Satellites are called PSAT and BRICSAT. PSAT's an amateur communication satellite, and BRICSAT is a small satellite that has a micropropulsion system to perform experiments with attitude control. Satellites are out of the United States Naval Academy. Let's see it. Oh, we won't see it. It's still backside. Here we go. 
Hopefully we hear a good call out for this one. Pod four deploy confirmed. And we have confirmation over the net from Avionics. HPK. P pod number four has deployed. The same time we now have acquisition of signal over heart of beast talk, known as HBK in Africa. Sweet. And we've got about 165 seconds until P pod five opens up. just crazy that they have the ability to do all of these precise movements in order to aim the exact satellites and, and aim them away from each other so they don't bump into each other. This stuff is impressive. This is a very, very, very complicated mission. This is, I mean, and they're going to have to change their inclination. Then they're going to raise their orbit to a medium Earth orbit. I mean, this is pretty bonkers. And uh, I was talking for a second about Light Sail 2. Um, Let's see. <laughs> um, oh yeah, and real quick, let's go back to this. John Krause had this awesome image, and it's gorgeous. You can see this is the 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 first stage burn, and then stage separation, and the the side boosters actually fly up, and then they come down. That's uh, they they continue their vertical velocity, and then they cancel out their horizontal velocity and actually aim back at at Florida. And so in doing so, they actually go up and come back around. So that's this is that entry burn way up here to slow down before it hits the atmosphere. And then finally, we see the landing burn. And it looks kind of sideways. Uh, that's the use of a extremely wide angle lens that's capable of getting all this in. In, in, this, in, just about, uh, it, in this case, this is a fisheye lens because you can see the, the barrel distortion in the bottom of the frame um, looks to be John, I'm going to guess you're on like a 14 mil uh, full frame, so 10 mil-ish, 9 mil fisheye, maybe a little wider, maybe maybe a little, little wider. Okay. Let's see this one. Now in this view, the Peapod dispenser is located uh, probably at about the 2 o'clock position around the dispenser the very top so you've got to look up there and we might see something going by however we're also starting to get a sun flare off of the camera peapod 5 deploy confirmed we've heard the confirmation peapod 5 is deployed so we're through five. We've got three more P pods to go. The last one will be deploying at T plus 50 minutes. So we've got another 16 minutes to get through this sequence. So the next one coming up should be deploying in about 285 seconds, a little more than four and a half minutes almost. Okay. So um, we can talk again. Okay, so I keep getting interrupted about light sail. So the Planetary Society, uh, this is light sail two. They flew light sail one just a handful of years ago. I I better double check actually before I light sail one. Um, it looks like it flew on um, May twentieth, twenty fifteen, um, with SpaceX, and uh, which is so basically what it is. It's, you take a tiny little spacecraft, you stretch a really 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 thin, huge giant like reflective blanket, kind of like this mylar coating on on the stage here that we're seeing in, in frame right now. You stretch that out to be the size of a, a tennis court, basically, uh, or even bigger. Uh, I don't remember if Light, if light Sail 2 is bigger. And then you literally just let the photons of light that come off of the sun bounce off of it. And in doing so, it actually produces a little bit of pressure and pushes the spacecraft. And it's a very, it's completely free, <laughs> free energy, basically. It can do this literally, basically, uh, forever and ever but it's very slow acceleration. It takes years to really uh, to do something, but it's it's extremely efficient. So, you know, you can launch, it doesn't scale up very well, but it'd be a, it's a great way to actually send um, spacecraft even further and further and further away uh, and, and gain Delta V for literally free. So it's a really cool system. Um, oh, that's a good question. I don't remember if it is 
photons or solar wind? That is a good question. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Free energy. Um, yeah. Um, someone pointing out that I'm a few seconds behind. I'm afraid that is the speed of light because I have to get the stream ingested into my server, rebroadcast it, get it back out to you. There's always going to be several seconds of delay, anywhere between 10 and 20. Um, sorry if those 10 or 20 seconds of knowledge are that important to you. Go watch SpaceX's stream. Um, but yeah, there's nothing I can do about that unless we can change physics. Um, but yeah. Photon pressure. Photons, photons, photons. Yes. Okay, awesome. Um, let me go back to answering some of you guys' questions because we had um, Joshua asked if they're launching some people's ashes. I didn't hear about that on this launch, but that is a thing that people are starting to do. Good question. Uh, Neil, thank you. Uh, Attender, thank you. DA Gordon, this is totally a Kerbal mission. It's like throwing everything on the same rocket as possible. Uh, very impressive mission. Um, I can't stress again, perfect landing of the side boosters. So far, the upper stage is performing phenomenally, um, really stretching the limits on it. Deployment over Africa. In fact, the next two P-Pods that will open and deploy satellites are in support of the NASA Enhanced Tandem Beacon Experiment, and they're built by the University of Michigan. This mission explores bubbles in the electrically charged layers of Earth's upper atmosphere. Now these bubbles can disrupt key communication and GPS signals that we rely on here on the ground. They currently appear and evolve unpredictably and are difficult to characterize from the ground. So the two satellites that will be deployed over the next several minutes are going to help try to understand that problem and find ways to work around it. As you can see on the map, we're currently over East Africa, downlinking through the Mauritius ground station. Again, looking up around 2 o'clock at the top of the stack, trying to see if we can spot the CubeSat coming out of the deployer. Peapod 6 deploy confirmed. We've got confirmation over the net. P-Pod 6 deployer has opened. We should have the Tandem Beacon Experiment satellite ejected. I was looking for it on the screen, but I didn't spot it. Uh, the white objects you've seen coming off to the right-hand side, uh, those are not the CubeSats. Now the second stage is now maneuvering to get in position for the next deployment. That's gonna come up in about five minutes from now. Um, I was wrong. I forgot that this launch does have uh, Celestis, which is, yeah, people's ashes. There's like 150 people uh, whose ashes are on this flight. I can sure move my face. Thanks for the reminder. Um, there are 150 ashes uh, of uh, of humans, which is pretty. Cr I would I would love that. I would um, if I happen to pass. Please, everyone, yell at my. Don't yell, please, <laughs> but tell my family that that would be my ideal way to be remembered. Um, that's really, really cool. That's very special. Um, white objects, you might be seeing either, you can see ice sometimes that comes off, breaks off from the upper stage. You can also see the other satellites oftentimes that have already been deployed trailing off in the background. So if you're wondering what those little things are, yep, pretty fun stuff. Uh, I realized we have a long ways to go here on uh, answering people's questions. So um, thank you. Uh, <laughs> total Kerbal Mission from DA Gordon. Uh, Rob Sonday, have I checked out Twitter at Apollo 50th? Yes, I have checked it out. Uh, everyone should probably do that. We are right square in the coming up on the 50th anniversary of the Apollo missions. Uh, I've got one video planned talking about it a little bit. I know there's going to be so much content. I figure I'd try to do a slightly different topic. So stay tuned for that. Um, 
Esh Daddy, thank you. You're a rocket star. Keep up the great work and inspiring future STEM stars. Thank you. Russ, thank you. Maria, Peter Fator, and John1948, thank you very much, guys. And Peter Fator again. Uh, Chili's Serrano, hello from El Paso. Hi there. Uh, Tezdal, thank you. Uh, Wade the, the Wallaby, I hate to donate, but you better tell me what the blue coin things do. Say hi to my mom. Hello to Wade the Wallaby, too. I'm not entirely sure what the blue coin thing, but it's at blue coin thig do. Um, I'm sorry, Wade the Wallaby. I, I'm not familiar with the blue coin. Uh, if you're talking about blue origin, um, I have a video about that. So it's titled, uh, is new shepherd, is, is new blue origins, new Glenn, uh, the king of heavy lift rockets. And I talk about kind of their, their different programs going and why the, the, um, new, <laughs> New Glenn is, yeah, is what it is. If that's what you're talking about, if you're talking about Blue Origin, yeah. Uh, then we have uh, uh, Georgie Djivovic. Love your videos and live streams. Learned so much. Thank you very much. And Mark Peterson, thank you. Uh, Nevin Leiby, no questions. Good luck. Well, thank you, Nevin. Jeez. Dang, thank you very much. Stefan Hobbs, 400 miles away in Orange Beach. Hoping you'll see it. I, I'll try to catch you if you, if you are. Oh, Elon did tweet about this, apparently. I want to check this out. Um, center core went rud. It was a long shot. That's all he said. Mm -hmm, sorry. Sweet. All right, well. Half a minute for the seventh of the eight Peapod openings. This is also a Tandon Beacon Experiment CubeSat. Now to study those bubbles that I talked about in the Earth's atmosphere, the two CubeSats that we're deploying emit signals in a handful of frequencies to stations on the ground. From there, scientists can measure disruptions in the signals to determine how they're affected by the upper atmosphere bubbles. Waiting for call out of Peapod 7 opening and the CubeSat deploying. Peapod 7 deploy confirmed. And we've got it a little late sounding, but we have confirmation. Peapod 7 is open to deploy the second of the two Beacon Experiment satellites for the University of Michigan. And all I've got to say for that is go blue. We're 375 seconds to the final deployment of the Peapod series. Okay, uh, for those of you that don't know what RUD is, RUD is Rapid Unscheduled Disassembly. It's just kind of a Kind of a bit of a joke term, a little tongue in cheek. Oh, look at that piece of ice. Ooh, that was fun. Look at that spinning off. That's so crazy. Um, yeah, RUD, uh, rapid unscheduled disassembly. It's, a, it's kind of a common term if something goes boom. And yeah, man, that was, yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, Stefan, let, let us know if you were able to see it in Orange Beach. Guy, thank you. Roko V, why do they name rename Mr. Stevens? Because they actually, the people that owned uh, the vessel, Mr. Steven, uh, sold it. And in doing so, you actually rename the vessel. I think SpaceX actually bought it. Someone correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but, yeah. Yeah, let me know if, if it was SpaceX that, that bought it. Um, and that's why they renamed it. Good question, Roko V. Curious people, thank you. Is uh, Israel Shirk? Uh, oh, awesome. Your five-year-old daughter is watching tomorrow. Well, I really appreciate you uh, exposing your daughter and, and or your family to uh, STEM stuff and to aerospace. I think this is really exciting stuff in my opinion, and it gets me so excited to know that there's uh, young people getting excited and young people being inspired by it. I mean, look at this stuff. How can you not? Look at just this image. How can you not want to get involved and not want to be excited? Uh, 
I thank you. Thank you for for tuning in and uh, and showing your daughter as well. That is awesome. Um, and S S S O Vicky, uh, good on you, Tim. Some people are just so strange. Yes, that was probably in reference to people uh, saying lewd things. Easton, thank you. Stefan, flaming and down pointy end up. It sure was. Um, uh, Brian Gleason, first time SpaceX is in Kennedy Space Center launch control room. Uh, hopefully you heard me talk about that. The firing room was used for DM-1, and I don't exactly know when all it's going to be used. Uh, if it's only, you know, launch complex 39A or if it's slick 40. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll see. Um, still not a fan of the military from um, Volvacat17. Humanity has to move past them to do... Uh, any ad major advancements in the future? No place for weapons in the future. I am with you. I'm like the absolute. Um, uh, I am the absolute biggest like friendly. I I, I want everyone to just get along and <laughs> biggest pacifist. I guess is that the right word? Pacifist? Pacifist? No. Pacifist? Sure. Anyway, I I'm not a big fan of war and and people fighting over things. I'd rather everyone just get along. But at the same time, the one thing that the military does do is it does advance technology. So uh, if you say humanity has to move past uh, military to, to do any major advancements, uh, military seems to really rapidly advance technology. And it's an unfortunate double-edged sword there. Um, but the best technology in the world has always come from the advancement in military. <sighs> yep. Um, but I agree with you, though. Um, Brian, no, thank you. Michael, uh, or uh, Mikhail, Michael, thank you very much. Sean Walter, thank you. Summit, love you, Falcon Heavy. I love Falcon Heavy too. Um, Eric Hayhurst, thank you so much. Um, Andrea Oni, uh, I think Jesse got got a promotion since the last Falcon Heavy. Uh, she said she's a lead manufacturing engineer. Yeah, so yeah, she's pretty great. That is awesome. Uh, good on Jesse. She is awesome. Um, at Tratoth, uh, how so? How quickly do you think they'll deploy twenty-four satellites? It's a six-hour-long mission here, so I'm not going to do all six hours here. I'll probably stop streaming after the next set of satellites. I won't wait for that that Miko that our medium Earth orbit Mio deployment and stuff. Um, oh, Geis Offshore bought Mystery now, or bought Mister Steven. Um, <laughs> pacifist thank you that's the right word i knew someone would correct me thank you um panda thank you greg keep on keeping on you're welcome um dave can you talk about the orbital plane changes 20 degrees is a lot how much mass to each orbit is this more efficient than two falcon 9 launches it must be more efficient than two falcon 9 launches um the, an inclination change like that, when you actually change your inclination 20 degrees, we talk about that a little bit in my uh, Why Do Cylindrical Rockets Rule. I, I talk about inclination and plane changes and um, azimuths and all that stuff. We kind of go into that a little bit, but a, a change of 20 degrees is substantial. 15 seconds. We're out between Africa and Australia getting ready for the last deployer which will release two CubeSats that have been working together starting at liftoff. One is the NASA LEO CubeSat, and the second is the StangSat CubeSat from Merritt Island High School. Now this combined mission will measure and record the temperature and acceleration data from within that deployer, the Peapod, during today's launch. Now in addition to collecting that telemetry data during the launch, StangSat will stream its data in real time via Wi-Fi to the LEO CubeSat, something that typically we've not seen done before in CubeSats. <laughs> We're waiting for call out of the CubeSat deploy. Peapod 8 deploy confirmed. Deploy confirmed and we saw it, I, at least I did, coming out of the top it of the screen. Of there. So StangSat and LEO have successfully separated and as a reminder, the Merritt Island High School team has been working on this project since 2011, according to their Facebook page. So after waiting a long time for a ride to space, we'll celebrate deployment with Go Mustangs. <laughs> cool. So we've gotten through the first set of satellite deployments. The Oculus SmallSat and the eight Peapods have all opened up. 
we've got a 21 minute break before we relight the second stage engine to change our orbit. So we'll be back with that. We're going to leave you with the animation that shows where we are in the coast phase, returning at T plus one hour, 12 minutes, just about 21 minutes from now, for the second burn of our upper stage engine. Yep, we're going to be here for a little bit. And I'll stick around, like I said, for this one, but I'm not going to try to do uh, the rest of that because that will be a long time. So <laughs> um, let's see. So so Dave, we were talking about the, the inclination change. You can see here uh, this orbit. It looks like this is sand's inclination change because they do have, uh, because the planet is rotating as it, it goes around it, it, that's where it will be in the next orbit. Those are in the same inclination. So changing inclination, if you were to change and go 180 degrees backwards, uh, it would take twice the, like it's in, it would take more, even, I think even changing 90 degrees takes about as much Delta V as getting into orbit in the first place. So you'd basically have to have another one of your entire rockets ready to go to be able to change your inclination 90 degrees. So 20 degree inclination change is substantial. Um, yeah, uh, Paul Jr. in our yeah, uh, Discord member says, tired of, of immature and out of subject comments in the YouTube chats, become a proud Patreon supporter everyday astronaut and of Everyday Astronaut and join us in the exclusive Discord. I do need to give a huge shout out, like always, to my Discord channel. Uh, I, they're always literally right here with me and uh, <laughs> we talk all the time. We're currently going through a fun little topic uh, about lunar landers. Uh, so if you'd like to just actually talk space and have a community of people to talk space with, consider becoming a Patreon member. You'll be uh, automatically dynamically linked to Patreon uh, or to Discord and a link to a Discord channel, which is kind of like a chat room server. Um, so go to patreon.com slash everyday astronaut. And of course, uh, all of that always helps me be able to travel and go say, see uh, launches I'm working on, hopefully being able to catch the hopper when that happens. We've had some delays as serial number four and serial number five seem to not be ready. And now it's probably going to be serial number six Raptor engine that's going to make the hopper fly. So if you want to help me continue to do what I do and uh, produce as much content as physically possible, uh, yeah, continue, consider becoming a Patreon supporter, patreon.com slash everyday astronaut. I say this every time, I genuinely could not be doing what I do without the support of you guys. So seriously, thank you. And not only that, the mental support, guys. Ugh. Having you guys at like 4 a.m. helping me answer questions and not lose my mind. You guys know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, yeah, oh, I should also mention, these shirts are are in pre-order. Um, these are the full Flow Sage Combustion Cycle shirts. Um, they will ship mid-July, and they actually will have this cool like patch, someone on patch. A little more premium style shirt this time. I'm really excited about these shirts. If you like these shirts, uh, consider going to everydayastronaut.com slash shop. Uh, that shop, we do only runs of shirts, so this one likely won't stay in the store for too long. Uh, and we, I think we only have like two more of these utility pouches. So if you guys want a utility pouch, you better literally do it right now because it will sell out. And then I don't have any plans to restock. These are literally handmade. Uh, here uh, in in freaking Pittsburgh by Anthony Anthony Kovacs. Look how beautiful that is. Um, yeah, they're orange on the inside, which is sick. I, I use it for travel bags. But we, and back by popular demand, I finally have my all over print shirts back. You guys have been asking for this for a long time. They're higher quality this time. Uh, again, we do runs of this, so this may run out very soon. Uh, actually, I think it's almost sold out. And then we're going to do for sure do one full run of the full flow stage combustion cycle shirt. Depending on if you guys like it, we might bring it back again in the future. So don't forget my store. We do runs of shirts, which means higher quality shirts with like custom tags and all that stuff. Uh, a much better product, much longer lasting, better print for you guys. So um, so if you like something, get it while you can because stuff sells out. Like our, <laughs> we still have to try to restock these. We're working on that. Um, but yeah, if you like it, get it now because it may not be in there in the future. So, yep, that's your, your little reminder on that stuff. Okay, let's answer a few more questions. We got quite the coast phase here. So, um, okay, so thank you for that reminder, Paul. And again, thank you guys. So, Redith, thank you. Panda, thank you. Redith, are we going to be able to see them land? Yes. Yes, we did. And they did an awesome job of getting us a nice clean drone ship shot. And you know what's funny? Because it missed the drone ship, that's probably why we got continual connection. Because the because it flew away from the drone ship, the satellite uplink 
was able to continue to produce a constant stream. So we actually got a, a full live stream of it, and it didn't cut out because the center core uh, missed the drone ship and its plasma didn't disrupt the satellite uplink. Pretty cool. I love that kind of stuff. Um, Summit, I am. you're getting goosebumps. Wish you could sit on top of the ferry and deploy yourself in space. I would probably take a proper spacecraft. Uh, although a ride on a fairing I, would be pretty cool. You just wear a spacesuit and you ride the inside of the fairing and then parachute down. That'd be pretty sweet. Uh, but yes, I also get goosebumps when I when I watch this. Still, um, sorry if you guys are wondering what I'm at, what I'm reading from. Uh, I'm still trying to catch up on the super chats. You guys uh, did a ton. I just want to make sure I, I get a chance to say hi to everyone that that uh, that said hi. So uh, thank you again uh, to uh, Sayu Sethi. Um, happy slarty Bart fast. That looked like heaven opening up a forest. Yeah, those interactions of the plumes were unbelievable. I mean, I, I love that kind of stuff. And I bet they're going to be using that as like modeling fluid dynamics and learning about those interactions and stuff. It's super, super cool. Um, let's see here. Uh, amazing in person. It wasn't me. Oh, it wasn't seven me. Jealous that you were there in person. Congrats on seeing a gorgeous launch. Um, I wish I was there for this one. Summit rot booster retrieve safely or things. Yeah, that was awesome. Right now, I work once again, but hope launch is going well. Thank you very much for now. Um, Summit, I love you, Center Core. <laughs> I like watching the replay of people's reactions. Uh, Nathan Camo, uh, thank you. Summit again. It's okay, guys. At least it didn't explode in the air. It landed. All right. On Earth. <laughs> Cheer up. That was crazy. That was one of the most intense missions I've seen. Um, Brian Packer, thank you very much. Uh, D2W Studios, I was watching the SpaceX stream, and it had to come after they didn't stick the lane to see your reaction. Shame, but I guarantee they'll learn a lot from it. Yes. So that's, I mean, that's the cool thing. The, the center, the landing of the boosters is always secondary to the primary mission. We're still looking at an uh, unbelievably success, successful mission. This is a challenging, challenging mission that uh, is pretty much unprecedented at this point. Deploying to three wildly different orbits using one spacecraft, pretty, pretty amazing. So uh, super cheers and kudos to the teams at, at SpaceX and, and the Air Force and uh, at NASA and the light sail teams for so far, just an awesome mission. It's a shame about the center core, but data is data. This will, and even what they learn from this will literally probably be able to be applied for space, you know, for Starship and all things coming up ahead. So, um, yeah, hopefully we just learn a little bit more. Um, value of boost stage is almost essentially. Um, so here's. Um, this is interesting. So Elon did get back on Twitter. I do want to read through this quick. Um, SpaceX updates says, why the last minute change from close to shore to so far downrange? And Elon replied, high payload Delta V missions will always be far downrange. Value of boost stage is measured essentially by horizontal velocity imparted to the upper stage. Altitude is almost unimportant. It, I, I don't quite think he understood the, the meaning of the question, which was intended that they actually change where the drone ship was intended to be and at least publicly so maybe it was just a public thing maybe they just didn't want people knowing ahead of time or something um yeah okay so let's see here okay uh so so jatton great coverage thank you very much green access agency holy moly do you think they did that on purpose i don't know about the diversion on purpose or if that's just a whoop do uh william s in the SpaceX IRC channel, they also suspected an, an engine failure. Um, Sven, two out of three isn't too bad. Uh, it's true, of course. Uh, DW Studios, there was a lot of flame brightness before we saw it tip over. I think they tried to land too high or misjudged their Delta V. Hard, hard saying, but I, I'm really excited to, to get answers out of this one. This will be a really fun learning experience. Um, William Barksdale, thanks for doing what you do, man. You're welcome. Thank you for hanging out. Um, Michael Julian, looks like the last second they were tipped over. Rest in pieces. Um, that is so true. Tra Tratoth uh, Lamparage. Uh, could have landing leg, could have a landing leg failed to deploy, so it, it GTFO, GTFOs uh, to make sure the drone ship doesn't get taken out. That would be an interesting concept. Um, yeah, that would be a very interesting concept. Um, Andrew Tay... Uh, 
Andrew in our in our Discord, I think those things aren't grid fins. I think those are the landing legs that you have pointed out as grid fins. Um, think about how brightly reflective they'll be. I don't think those are grid fins. They'd be teeny tiny. Um, so, okay, the, the flamey part was sideways confusion. Yes. Uh, Spaceman, hello from Jacksonville, Florida. I will email pics. Awesome, Spaceman. Uh, Jeremiah Flickinger, thanks for being awesome as always. You're welcome. And Sister of Soviki, uh, I don't want to speculate. Proceeds to speculate. I know. I'm guilty of that for sure. I mean, it's just so easy to get caught up in it. Uh, but I, I, speculating is okay, but uh, but saying that you have the answers, and, and I'm not going to speculate any further until we get more answers. You know, I, I'm i not going to make a video about it uh, and all that stuff. I, I, I think that can be... I don't know. I a little mini rant time. I definitely I wore myself out trying to be on top of everything at all times and just trying to kind of chase that news cycle of things. It's it's exciting because trust me, I want to be at the absolute forefront of all those topics and and of all those you know anything that happens with Starhopper, Falcon Heavy, you know DM One or the Dragon Caps, all those things. I do want to be at the front of that stuff. I like I like being in the know, but it can be damaging to totally just like go out there and and talk about things without the proper knowledge. And I've really tried to value myself um, on the educational aspects of, of rocket science and, and getting people excited about the things that, that do go right or, or learning from the things that we do learn uh, in the meantime. And it's been a, a, maybe a mental shift for me and it's still something that I have to practice, <laughs> you know, practice being patient and practice uh, what I preach, I guess, as far as like not totally just wildly speculating all willy nilly. Uh, and and spreading rumors and things like that. That is definitely something that I need to practice on. But I've I've tried to focus my content, at least on my channel, that the produce videos on really chasing down long, more in depth uh, research topics. And to me, I, I think those are more worth it. Uh, I I still I push myself too much on those as far as the timing. Like I work uh, 60, 70, 80 hours a week often. Uh, especially I, I put these like arbitrary deadlines on myself normally if it's like, oh, I'm going to be gone for a week. I, I've got to get the video up before that week, you know, even though it doesn't really matter, but for some reason to me it does. And then I don't sleep at all. And then I just work way too hard. But to me, it's, it is important to focus on those, you know, more evergreen topics that we can always learn from, you know, in three years learn from, as opposed to a video where those facts might be out there if, if they're wrong. You know, if you're talking about something uh, totally willy nilly. If I sat there and made a, a video tomorrow about how the outer engine, you know, clearly turned off and it pitched over sideways and we could tell by the angle of this, you know, and, and did a whole rundown and was totally wrong. That's going to be out there for a long time and it's going to be really hard to, uh, correct people. And that's the one thing as far as academia goes that I wish YouTube did better. I wish YouTube would allow you to make changes to videos, make updates to videos, especially if they are under the guise of, of proper information, because you can easily spread. I have videos that have a line or two or three things that are wrong. And it just eeks me to this day. The fact that like one time I accidentally said prograde instead of retrograde twice in a video, just, I have no idea why I said it. I even, it was in the script as retrograde and I said prograde, just read it wrong. And, uh, it eeks me that that, that mistake is in there to this day. I, I, you know, I wish I could just go in. You can't even do annotations anymore on YouTube. Um, you, you can't like insert a clip. I wish certain channels could get approved to make like tweaks or updates based on new information. Just so the videos academically uh, hold up better, you know, especially now we're getting more and more updates on the Raptor engine and, and Elon apparently watched my 50 minute long Raptor engine video and, and gave a few updates uh, to some of the numbers that I had in the video. I would have loved to be able to like plop those in the video quick and make little updates, but um, yeah. So there you go. That's my, that's a... Uh, <laughs> That's my long rant about YouTube and about speculation. So uh, thanks for the reminder. Please, guys, keep me humble on that because it is really excited. It's exciting to get caught up in that speculation stuff. So, um, yeah. Chris Kuhn, thank you very much. Kevin Craig, thank you. Tyler Pantaleo, uh, we may need a new Not How to Land a Rocket 2 now. You're right. And they'll show, they could show the center core booster tipping over. But that's a, those are the only landing field. Oh yeah, because that how not to land a rocket didn't have CRS sixteen booster either. Ten fifty, the one that had a grid fin lockup. You're right. We, there's probably some awesome, awesome looking uh, footage out there from from all these things. Um, sweet. So crazy. Thank you, Jonathan. Everyone use your free super chat if you have one. That's awesome. I didn't know that was a thing. Thank you, uh, Chris Kuhn. Again, thank you. 
Uh, Squiddy, thank you, Kevin Smith. Thank you for sharing your excitement with the world. Well, I, I again, my excitement just is purely driven from how uh, the the incredible things that we're seeing happen in such a short amount of time in the past five years since I've been really, really covering this stuff and watching it. It's almost well, six years ish now. It's it's nuts. It's unbelievable. And ugh, yeah, I, I can't wait for the next the twenty twenties are going to be like a huge industry shift. I mean, if I think it's kind of like, I feel like we're going from very quickly in the, in the rocket industry. We went from, you know, little tiny little like Wright brothers airplanes. Then we landed on the freaking moon in like a 10 year span basically. And to me that was like going from Wright brothers airplanes to, um, to using airplanes kind of in like in war, you know, like world war one, they, they started using airplanes with guns on them and stuff like that. And they became a, a, a tool and they actually had useful purpose. And I think we're now finally coming up on that, that era of like the DC-3 and the commercial airliner. And that's going to be a massive shift. Like, I, I can't wait for that. So, um, yeah, I'm just really excited. Um, D2W Studios, uh, watch the footage again. There's a lot of flame brightness before we see it veer off. I think landed too high must be a bit different with three. Uh, don't forget though, with as far as three engine landing burns, they do often. Uh, they do three engine and three engine landing burns quite often, and lo lots of times, you know, I think they stuck one like JC Sat sixteen or something in like twenty fifteen already. They stuck their first three engine landing burn where it actually touched down basically with all three with three of those engines burning, which is crazy. Um, the center core or the the two side boosters, for instance, do a three engine landing burn, but they start with a single. They go to the the outers, so making it three, and then they cut the outers. So they just kind of do an ex an acceleration ramp where they um, probably pull it up to a full like three Gs and then back it back down, and that just gives them some wiggle room, uh, a, a bit of throttle ability to really nail that landing. So, yeah, uh, um, a niche looks looks diverted overhead ignition then sideways. E yeah, um, let's see. Sorry, I lost where we're at. Man, you guys are. Jeez, um, I cannot keep up with you guys. Where did I got lost? Okay, um, thanks Eugene for the new membership. Mario, is the debris flying by? Great stream. Yes, debris like ice chunks and maybe other some of the other satellites haven't been deployed. Um, uh, Jaden, thank you. Okay, we're just double checking in there. Sorry. Um, SS SSG Stanford center core just had a delayed reaction to the to the snap is all <laughs> oh man that was crazy uh Marchio Camargo love your channel keep the good work thank you um L L Logan rest in pieces center core 1057.1 <sighs> yeah no Zumu uh you can see the earlier deployment sat drifting away for the past 10 minutes it was lighter Dot mixed with frozen oxygen drifting away. Absolutely. Yep. Good call. DTW Studios. Nothing you can do about latency till Starlink. Well, even then, there's still going to be some processing in YouTube's end that's going to delay my stream from an official stream. There's always going to be some, um, you know, even if I'm getting it straight from the pipe, there's going to be some kind of delay there. Matthew, thank you. Um, oh my, oh, OMG, it's JPC. Thank you. Uh, Swan Cherie, thank you. Cass, thank you. William. 533 plus 152 new people in Earth orbit equals 685. Um, not to be more, but I just don't think that I I, I don't think we're gonna count people's ashes as people in orbit, would we? Because that could get out of hand very quickly if we start considering the deceased members of the astronaut corps. I don't know. Interesting though. Interesting thought. 685 people in space. I'm not going to take that away from them. To the friends and families of uh, people that just flew uh, your loved ones, that's very admirable. And again, please do that with me, everyone. <laughs> Let my family know. Oh man, that is, it is beautiful. Can you imagine? Uh, Robert Dahlquist, thank you so much. Chris Harris, Rudd equals rocket under the water. <laughs> Oh, uh, Dr. E, the center core crashed at 58 meters per second if it, acce if it accelerated at 3G. Interesting. Um, I'm not entirely sure where your numbers are coming from, 
but sure. Um, yeah. It's, I mean, yes, if it was accelerating at 3G, I don't really know why it would be, though. Um, uh, Michael Wiseman, just like the Raptor serial number five, liberating parts, yes. <laughs> uh, Patrick, don't know if anybody asked you this before, but you already ordered, did you already order your Apollo Moon Lander Lego model? I have two, of course. I have not assembled it. I have not had a minute to do so. I probably should do that, though. It looks, it's just been sitting there. I normally like to keep, I like to build one and then keep one. Uh, John, thank you, Center, if, and thank you, Patrick. John, if the center core couldn't scrub enough speed, it may have executed an abort sequence that tries to avoid damaging the drone ship. <sighs> I don't know if there is the ability to actually full-blown divert like that. Um, it's really more just the, the profile of landing requires like dog legs and, and maneuvers that require all the parts to make it hit the drone ship. So if any of the parts don't work, uh, it's unlikely that the core would hit the drone ship. It's not to say it, it wouldn't, but it, it it almost does require all of the maneuvers in order to get to the drone ship in the first place. So I'm not sure if it has the ability to divert. A great liftoff from pad 39A at Kennedy Space Center. We are less than a minute away from the second of our four second stage engine burns. In fact, counting down, we're a little more than 25 seconds to go. Currently, we're chilling in the second stage. We're passing over the Southwest Pacific at this time. Everything looking good as we get ready to light the second stage engine. Currently, we're settling propellant down on top of the turbo pumps. So that when we spin the pumps, they've got plenty of liquid to pull through and light the engine. Seconds away from ignition. Engine at power. Nice and quick. We've heard the call out. Engine is at power. This is planned to be about a 22 second burn. Throttling down the MVAC engine. And we heard a report, we have good shutdown. Okay, good. Keep going, baby. You can do it. Running a marathon tonight. Nominal orbit insertion. And what we love to hear, the guidance navigation and control engineer over the countdown net reports good orbital insertion. So we've had a good burn and a good insertion. Now that we're in the good orbit, we're gonna be coasting again for the next five minutes or so. We'll be back around T plus one hour, 18 minutes and 30 seconds for our next set of deployments. So stay with us. This will be a series of 10 small satellites as well as the light sail and six cosmic satellites. Sweet. And ladies and gentlemen there, we've got way out in the Atlantic, even farther away than the drone ship. Ms. Tree they got successfully a with a payload fairing half, the second payload fairing half they've also spotted in the water, but we have accomplished the first landing on the net of a, pa a Falcon payload fairing half. So another first time accomplishment yes. Yes. for the SpaceX team, especially out there in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Wow, okay. Now that's something I didn't see coming. I really was not sure if that was even freaking ever going to happen. Good work. Wow. Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. Can, now, don't lose it off the side there. But holy cow. That's exciting. That's really exciting. If they bring a fairing back totally dry. Yes. <laughs> Um, hold on, I'm going to record this one too and tweet that. That is so exciting. Look at that. Hold on, guys. I'm going to go. One hour, 18 minutes, and 30 seconds. Okay, hold on. Our next set of deployments. So stay with us. This will be a series of 10 small satellites as well as the light sail and six cosmic satellites. And ladies and gentlemen, there we've got way out in the Atlantic, even farther away than the drone ship. <sighs> I messed Ms. up my recording. Hold on. Successful Atlantic, Atlantic. 
And ladies and gentlemen, there we've got way out in the Atlantic, even farther, and six cosmic satellites. And ladies and gentlemen, there we've got way out in the Atlantic, even farther away than the drone ship, Ms. Tree successfully with a payload fairing half, the second payload fairing half they've also spotted in the water, but we have accomplished the first landing on the net of a, pa a Falcon payload fairing half. So another first time accomplishment for the SpaceX team, especially out there in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Okay, that's awesome. Sorry, I'm gonna get all caught up back here. I wanna just get this ready to, uh, I wanna tweet that out again. That is, that's nuts. I did not expect that. Quorum loss of signal. Um, actually, you know what we should do? You know what might be more fun? Would be watching. Let's, let's record uh, my reaction here because I bet my reaction was pretty genuine. I did not see that coming. <laughs> okay, that's that's pretty funny. One second, guys. I'm gonna I'm gonna pull this up. <laughs> Hold on. Sorry for making you watch me record a video here, but too bad. Uh, one second. <laughs> okay, where is this? <laughs> Full blown. I was not expecting that at all, guys. One second, I'm, I'll be right back with you. I'm gonna record this. Uh, you there? Sweet. And ladies and gentlemen, there we've got way out in the Atlantic, even farther away than the drone ship, Ms. Tree, they got successfully a with a payload fairing half. The second payload fairing half they've also spotted in the water but we have accomplished the first landing on the net of a, pa a Falcon payload fairing half. So another first time accomplishment yes, yes. for the SpaceX team, especially out there in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Wow, okay. Now that's something I didn't Welcome see coming. Welcome back to the STP-2 really mission sure as we await the next freaking. set of deployments. First up is Prox-1 Microsat developed by students at Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta to demonstrate satellite close proximity operations and rendezvous. Prox-1 is not an acronym, but actually got its name from the word proximity. It is basically running some proximity operations or formation flying experiments with the LightSail CubeSat for the Planetary Society. The light sail will not be released immediately from Prox-1. That will actually happen seven days after it separates from Falcon Heavy. When this happens, the light sail will unfurl its mylar sail, which is 1 20th of the thickness of a sheet of paper, with an unfurled area of 344 square feet. This will be the largest solar sail ever demonstrated as a primary means of propulsion. We won't have a visual of this deployment. There, there is also a good chance we may not have real-time confirmation of deployment since we will be over the Kwajalein ground station. Kwajalein can only record data. It does not send SpaceX real-time. So we may have to wait a few minutes until we come over Guam station to get confirmation of deployment. So again, that deployment should be happening in a couple seconds here. We will get back to you on that confirmation once we get that telemetry back. Now, the next deployment, and they keep coming, folks, will be for NPSAT and will occur in about two minutes. NPSAT was built by the Naval Postgraduate Research Laboratory, and it carries a bunch of experiments. But in layman's terms, it's investigating the concentration of electrons in the ionosphere, one of the outer layers of Earth which influences radio transmissions. It's also doing experiments to improve communications and the survivability of computers in space and demonstrating a new type of solar cells for power production. This deployment we will be able to see, hopefully, so let's sit back and wait to see it deploy. And that's coming up in about a minute from now, a little over a minute. That was so crazy, guys. Now, it look, looks like we're still uh, waiting to get connectivity, so... Despite what I just said, we may not get a visual. Hopefully that comes back on for us.
Now again, we anticipate hearing a call out confirmation of deployment for MPSAT in about a minute from now. Hopefully we'll get a visual as well. Man. Still waiting on that connection over Guam. We're about 30 seconds away from deployment of the MPSAT. AOS Hawaii. Prox 1 deploy confirmed. And we did just hear confirmed over the nets that Prox 1 deploy was confirmed. Very exciting, another successful deployment. And in about 10 seconds from now, hopefully we'll hear the same thing and see it as well for NPSAT. They have such a busy, this is such a busy mission. Wow. There and goes. there you see the release on your screen of MPSAT, MP a successful deploy deployment. Confirmed. And confirmed over the nets. Amazing. The next deployment will be for the General Atomics Electromagnetic Systems Orbital Testbed, or OTB. Separation will occur in just about a couple minutes from now. Due to the positioning of our camera, though, we will not be expecting to see this deployment live. OTB is a versatile modular platform based on a flight-proven hosting model to test and qualify technologies. Acquisition SSC Hawaii. On STP-2, OTB is hosting several payloads for technology demonstration purposes, including the Deep Space Atomic Clock, designed, built, and operated by NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory on behalf of the Space Technology Mission Directorate to revolutionize how spacecrafts navigate. This Deep Space Atomic Clock could change the way we navigate in space. It will be the first ever ion clock flown in space and represents the beginning of an era of better space clocks based on the mercury ion. It loses only one second in nine million years. Any atomic clock for navigation has to be very precise. Even a clock that is off by one second could mean the difference between landing on Mars and missing it by miles. Times 1.6 for kilometers. In ground tests, the deep space atomic clock stays stable and keeps correct time for weeks, even months. It's up to 50 times more stable than the atomic clocks on GPS satellites. If the mission can prove the stability in space, it will be one of the most precise clocks in the universe. The toaster oven-sized instrument will be tested in Earth orbit for one year, with the goal of being ready for future missions to other worlds. Wow. And we should be seeing this coming up, in a, or hearing the call out actually, in just about 10 seconds from now. Again, we will not be able to see this live since it is not in our camera view. OTB payload deploy confirmed. And we just got that confirmation for the OTB deployment. Our next deployment is coming up in about three minutes, and this is for the Green Propellant Infusion Mission, or GPIM which is a NASA mission that develops a green alternative to conventional chemical spacecraft propulsion systems. Once NASA demonstrates the fuel and compatible system in space, green propellant could replace hydrazine as the status quo space flight propellant. Not only will green propellant be safer, it will also be faster and much less costly. Again, due to the positioning of our camera, we are not expecting to see this deployment live either but we can listen in for confirmation at about T plus t one hour and 27 minutes. Hopefully we'll get that confirmation over the nets. So let's get back to some questions real quick. I already saw that us, I just caught uh, Sumit had a question about an object floating over the engine. Uh, right now you're seeing, did you see that little ice chunk that was there for a second? Um, we talked about this an awful lot the last mission. There's ice that comes off of these vehicles all the time, uh, whether it be ice that's built up on the outer uh, portion of the vehicle, bleed off from the oxygen, uh, as liquid oxygen bleeds off. You notice now that that chunk of oxygen is missing. Uh, when, when oxygen is exposed to the vacuum of space, it turns solid and turns into ice chunks. Um, there's also sheets of ice oftentimes on the side of the booster. There's, there's just crazy ice stuff and stuff like that all the time. There's objects all over. So we talked about this in, in great detail last time that it's normal to see little pieces of debris, little things floating around. 
totally normal. Um, nothing to like if we pointed out every single launch, we'd have to sit there and talk about it for 10 minutes because <laughs> it is in every single launch. Um, yeah, John again, thank you. Matthew Cummins. Uh, it's awesome seeing Elon answer your questions on Twitter. Can you ask Elon if we'll ever be able to see the two-stage deorbit burn, the second-stage deorbit burn? That's a good question. Um, I th Some of that might, you know what, I bet that is probably public opinion, the, the idea that they don't want to, let the you know just announce and broadcast the idea that like hey we're now deorbiting the stage and it's going to crash back into the <laughs> into the earth even though it's very controlled and they literally have exclusion zones for the re-entry as well uh i i just don't think i'm guessing that some of the, they don't want just like broadcasting intentionally you know those that know know but no need to create like pandemonium over it um Fox Pup, thank you. Sambi, thank you. Mike Parker, great broadcast. <laughs> it just keeps getting better. This has been a one roller coaster of a launch. Wow. I cannot imagine the emotions from everyone that has been all over this this mission. Um, wow. Uh, Clab, thank you. Uh, Shantanu Pont, thank you. From India, awesome. Hello, Indian viewers. And I, I will be doing an ISRO video this year, I guarantee it. Did we just miss a payload deploy? Hmm. They just said GPIM deploy confirmed. And we have just confirmed, and we actually saw a little bit of confirmation, excuse me, of deployment of GPIM satellite. We're now one step closer to changing the way we travel to and around space. Well, T plus one hour, 27 minutes, 40 seconds, and the hits just keep on coming. Next up in about four minutes is the deployment of six Cosmic 2 satellites. Now, Cosmic 2 is a partnership between the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the United States Air Force, Caltech's Jet Propulsion Lab in support of NASA, Taiwan's National Space Organization, the United Kingdom Surrey Satellite Technology Limited, the Brazil Institute of Space Research, and the Australia Bureau of Meteorology. Well, that's a mouthful, especially an hour and a half into the webcast. Well, this six satellite constellation will provide next generation global navigational satellite system radio occultation data. Now, radio occultation data is collected by measuring the changes in a radio signal as it's reflected, refracted in the atmosphere. That means we sample radio signals that have traveled through the atmosphere to measure temperatures and moisture in the Earth's atmosphere layers. This will be used to better predict weather events like hurricanes and model long-term climate trends around the world. Now, if you've seen our simulation of the deployment on the SpaceX webpage, SpaceX.com, look for STP-2, got a nice video of all the satellite separations, You'll notice that the second stage rotates along the roll axis to orient each of the six cosmic satellites for release. So the sequence we go through for each satellite, the second stage slews using cold nitrogen gas thrusters to get to the correct pointing vector, and then we command from the flight computer the signal that will release the satellite. Once that satellite is deployed, the flight computer then commands the stage to rotate to the next position, and another cosmic satellite is deployed and we'll repeat this process until all six are separated. Now currently we're coming up in a little under two minutes for Cosmic 2-5 to deploy. The numbers are one through six, but we don't deploy them in that order. The view you can see from space right now, just a second ago, the SpaceX camera on the back end of the second stage showed the MVAC-D nozzle extension. It's cold after its recent second burn and we occasionally vent liquid oxygen out the drain tube to help keep pressure stable in the stage. Not this view, but the other one showed one of those nice pieces of solid oxygen. That's oxygen in the vacuum of space. It's so cold that it's turned into solid. It's not a liquid or gaseous oxygen like we breathe. That gives it that very fragile looking uh, Christmas tree look, <laughs> and it's not very hard. It's a very fragile substance. You'll see those pop off during the flight, and you'll probably see them going past the camera looking forward from time to time as the stage maneuvers around. Now currently we are in a three and a half minute maneuver to get to the correct position for the deployments. As I mentioned, the next deployment comes up at just after 31 and a half minutes 
one hour, 31 and a half minutes into flight. So we're gonna wait and look for it. Now in the view that you can see on your monitor, Cosmic 2-5 is in the top left of center. You can see part of it has a white bottom. That should be the Cosmic 2-5 satellite that we'll see deploy coming up here in just over one minute. Just next to it is another one of the Cosmic satellites. And then there's a third one also on the right above the one closest to the camera. So we should have three good views. And there goes the first Cosmic, Cosmic satellite. Two, satellite five, deploy confirmed. Right on time. Within a second or so of the timeline that was set up days ago. So everything mm -hmm. looking good. Now the Cosmic satellites, as I mentioned, are mounted around the dispenser. Now if you remember again our Iridium missions, we had two cylinders mounted on top of each other, each holding five satellites. Now the design for STP-2 has two cylinders that hold the cosmic satellites. There are four satellites on the lower cylinder and on the, there are two on the upper cylinder. We just saw one of them on the lower cylinder, Satellite 5, separate. And of course, just like the Iridium mission, our camera cannot see all sides of the cylinder. So we had a great view just now of the first cosmic deployment, but the next two coming up are out of view. Maybe, however, during the next 15 minutes as we're maneuvering that second stage, we might get a glimpse of the larger satellites as the sun bounces off of them as we head towards evening uh, over the Pacific Ocean. So currently, next separation coming up in just over two minutes. That'll be Cosmic 2-6. That one will not be visible from the camera. We'll be back to talk about that in a couple of minutes. So correct me if I'm wrong, I'm pretty sure they did already deploy. Uh, I'm pretty sure LightSail was inside Prox 1, is that correct? Um, I, had, I saw somebody, uh, somebody ask about that. Um, uh, another thank you to, uh, to Michael Weiser. Thank you, uh, Chase Cottle, because you're awesome. Thank you, uh, Homer Bloody Simpson. People in Darwin might be able to see uh, if the sky is clear. I don't know where Darwin is, but that's that would be awesome to see it tonight. Uh, TJ Manko, thank you twice. CJ23 Sailor, those serving the military are not fans of war either. The difference is that we set uh, up when it becomes necessary. Step up, sorry, when it becomes necessary. Good way to put it. Bradley, thank you. Jeffrey Lowe, do you think the video feed would be instant if they developed quantum entangled computers? Also, thanks for your broadcasting and your knowledge. That I don't know. That is well outside of my expertise, Jeffrey. Uh, wow. <laughs> you bring in the big questions at 3 a.m. Oh, <laughs> I maybe may I have no idea. Good question and thank you though, uh, Sabusby. Uh, thanks to my dad for always being on the side of science and technology and turning his adult kids into huge nerds. You're the best, and we love you, Dad. Happy belated Father's Day. Dang, that was a nice little tribute there, uh, Sabusby. Yeah, my dad was the same way. My dad was a huge, uh, is a huge gearhead and definitely instilled i mean my love of of motorcycles and cars and actually he wasn't a big he owned one motorcycle but he, he wasn't a big fan of me owning about a dozen motorcycles that i ended up having uh but he definitely got me really interested in cars and things that go fast and mechanics and taking things apart and that was a big part of my childhood was uh, there we go we just had another satellite deploy i'll keep this up big because it's pretty cool um so yeah, awesome. Uh, so hello to Sa uh, Sabusby and Sabusby's dad. Engineering reports looking at the telemetry that the Cosmic 2-6 satellite successfully deployed. Now, similar to what we do on Iridium, we've got another two minute pause. And we'll be back for Cosmic 2-2 deploy. This one also will not be visible from the camera. All right, I'll keep answering here. Uh, Nick, hi from New, New Zealand. Uh, when are you coming to watch an Electron? I really, that's, I want to come, what will be your guys' this summer because I think that'd be awesome. Like sometime like November, December, January, go down when I'm sick of it being cold already, come watch an Electron launch, hang out for a week in New Zealand. That, that's, that will happen. Uh, I want my first Electron launch to be in New Zealand though and I'm, Really afraid I'm going to be too tempted to go watch one when they open up Wallops, which will probably be this year. So, mm. oh, look at that. You can see the, the altitude kind of stage one and stage two. 
right here. That's pretty cool. Huh. Wow. Anyway, um, yes, so count me in. Come say hi when I'm in New Zealand. Uh, Green Access Space Agency. Uh, yeah, I don't know what to do about the... But if some smart bot person figured out how to program it so that... Yeah, I'm sorry about that. I, I, there's no, I've got filters popped up and I still... ...forms radio occultation data by sending signals through the Earth's atmosphere has successfully deployed. Next up will be Cosmic 2-4. That'll be coming up at one minute, or one hour, 39 well, minutes, Hawaii, 57 expected. seconds. Signal FSC in Hawaii expected. And we are reporting loss of signal as planned of Hawaii, ground station contact with the second stage, as we flying further eastward, passing now through the Vandenberg ground stations and coming up on the SpaceX ground station in South Texas a little bit later on. But for now, we've got another couple of minutes. South Texas. And there you heard it, the South Texas ground station. Oh. SpaceX is located there, has picked up the Falcon Heavy second stage. It's amazing. So we'll be back in a couple of minutes when we listen to the deploy of Cosmic 2-4. This satellite should be visible. It's on the bottom center, or just left of center, that large satellite that was next to 2-5 when it separated a little while ago. We'll be back shortly to watch that deploy. All right, so we'll keep going here. Um, so, uh, Nonary, thank you for your content. You're welcome. Thanks for hanging out. Uh, Summit Rayut, I apparently forgot to say your name. I'm I apologize for that. I'm sorry, Samut, Samit, Samit. I'm sorry. And hi. Thank you again. Uh, Renau, how was the launch? Hate missing them live due to work. Oh, you, this is going to be one you will absolutely have to watch all the way through. This is an unforgettable launch with mm, still going on with so many things packed into a single launch. No wonder this is easily considered their most difficult launch today. I mean, just pushing everything to the limits it is crazy. Alexander says, Tim, you need to go to Australia before Kiwi Land. I've already been to New Zealand. I went to New Zealand and visited Rocket Lab last year. Um, but I didn't go for a launch. I went to check out their brand new headquarters. Uh, so unfortunately, I already have been to New Zealand before I made it to Australia. Well, we're about 45 seconds away from the fourth of the six Cosmic 2 satellites. This one, hopefully, we get a nice view. Currently, the camera cycles between views of the nozzle. Now we're looking forward, and then we should stick with the forward-looking view, and hopefully we'll see the satellite that's right front dead center there separate coming up in about 13 seconds. All right, about 10 seconds to go. There it goes. Cosmic 2, Satellite 4, deploy confirmed. Cosmic Bye -bye. 2, Satellite 4, the one we intended is on its way <laughs> into its own orbit. You can see a little bit of that round mounting ring where the satellite was attached to the dispenser that's attached on top of the Falcon Heavy second stage. So next up, we've got Cosmic 2-1. That one is on the back side. That'll be in three minutes. We won't be able to see it. And then we'll wrap up with Cosmic 2-3. So we're four down, two to go with the Cosmic satellites. The P-Pods have all opened. They've deployed their CubeSats. The small sats have all deployed. So we've got two more Cosmics to go. And then if you can see at the top left of center, that large white flat panel, the very last satellite to be deployed, and that's still another uh, couple hours away almost. That's the DSX satellite that'll cap off the mission. So that one's gonna be there for a while, but we'll be bringing you that after we get through the third and the fourth burns of the upper stage engine. But for now, we're going to sit back, watch the video from space, and prepare for Cosmic 2-1 deploy coming up in just over two minutes. Okay, so a few more. I'm, I'm going to try to get through all these before I go to bed because, yeah. Uh, thank you, Amand, Ahmad Vaughn. Uh, Foyd, uh, thank you for making, you're welcome for making content play with Nathan. Thank you. Uh, Excalibur, how much has been, uh, so our, to get into our Discord, uh, it is the, 
not commander, mission specialist tier. Just go to Patreon, you'll see the tiers there if you would like to join our Discord channel. Um, oh yeah, I saw in our Discord, by the way, I did see that there's a little bit of explanation about quantum entanglement. Uh, again, I, I not that I don't trust Trevor Sesnick uh, in our Discord, but uh, yeah, quantum computer, he says you can't do quantum entanglement data transmissions. Sure, I have no idea. I don't have. I haven't ever studied any of that enough to even know what that really means. What I just said. Um, uh, Death Wish, did it fall? Yes. Uh, not fail. Well, the center core didn't quite perform as expect as hopeful. It performed about as the expectation of it. So, um, Grinch Master two point oh, it flew over your house. Jealous. Uh, Mizuno Mark just wanted to say your SpaceX Raptor engine is the best engine video and video on repeat for a week. Thank you for all your awesome, awesome work. You do. Wow, thank you, Mizuno Mark. That honestly means a lot because yeah, I felt like I tried to put all of the effort into that video. So I'm really glad to see people are using it as a good resource and, and hopefully learning, uh, m hopefully as much as they ever have about rocket engines because I learned a lot making that video. So I'm just glad to see other people are learning as well. So um, that's awesome. Thank you for watching. Play with Nathan, thank you again. James Burke, new member, hello, thank you. Uh, Nuzumo, they should rename it Mr. Hands because catching. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, no more mystery. Uh, D2W Studios, congrats on SpaceX for the first recovering. Absolutely huge, awesome achievement. Chris, hi from Germany. Thanks for your great channel and the effort you always make. Uh, it would be great if you could use, uh, if you could cover some of the private unmanned, well, uncrewed moon missions. Like the uh, Alina missions by PT scientists in one of your videos. Did you guys just? Yeah, but I'll I'll look into it. Um, uh, yeah, Sumit Rot. Yeah, we talked about your question earlier. And hello again. Oh. The way we're working it right now is catch one half. And I'm going to learn. I want to hear about this. Just so you know, we only intended to catch one half of the fairing. The other half did go into the water. They did see that. The way we're working it right now is catch one half and make sure that you've got that process understood. Then we'll come back and learn how to do two at a time. So right now, coming up, T plus one hour, 44 minutes and 50 seconds. Everything going well. We'll be back for the final deploy of the cosmic satellites shortly. Sweet. Keep on keeping on. Yeah, I'm actually going to catch up to real time. There we go. Okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we, we talked about that, uh, Sumit. Uh, Richard, Octagrabber, fairing, catching all these deployments. This is a crazy night. G great coverage. Thank you very much, Richard. It is honestly just plain bonkers. Um, MG Peepo, you, you are a Patreon, but you can't enter the Discord it will automatically dynamically link to your email and your Discord channel. So just go through, maybe double check your settings in, in Patreon, make sure you're at the right tier, and then you will have access uh, automatically. I don't have to do anything. That's why I do it that way. It'll automatically be um, linked up to Discord. So um, hopefully we get that figured out. If not, uh, message me on Patreon. Um, Samut, thank you. You're welcome. And thanks again. Uh, Nick. Nick Perry, definitely will say hi. You can meet your pug. That's awesome. I love dogs. Big fan of dogs. Good fan of good boys. And I want to just pet them. Oh. <laughs> and we've heard the call out from avionics to confirming what we all just got to see. Cosmic 2-3 successfully deployed. That makes six for six for the Cosmic satellites. Everything continuing to go well on the deployment sequence. Now we've had 23 satellites deployed, and we have just one more to go. But to get there, we have a couple of second stage engine burns to perform before Lots we're ready to release that Being final DSX satellite into space. So for now, we're entering a 20 minute coast phase, so we're going to take a break, but we are leaving you with an animation Bermuda. that shows where we are in the coast phase and some of that great SpaceX music. We'll be back around T plus two hours, seven minutes, for the third of four ignitions of our second stage engine. Sweet. Okay, I'm just gonna get through this and then I'm going to bed because it is after 3 a.m. for me, so. Um, okay, 
Uh, yeah, Nick, I would love to pet your pug. Uh, Renal, glad I was able to stop it and see the confirmation of the fan recovery. Guess he can finally release that video. Renal, you're correct. I do have a video shot, but so much has changed since I shot that video. It's absolute scrap at this point. So that video is literally scrapped, including that's an old spacesuit video. And I, I no longer wear the spacesuit for many, many reasons. Uh, comfort being the number one reason, but also just branding and, um, and the tone has kind of changed. If you haven't noticed my channel, the tone's changed a little bit. I like to think it's it's more genuine. It's a lot more just simple and maybe less abrasive is kind of the tone I'm going for. So in order to be, I had a lot of people, you'd be surprised how many people said, why are you wearing that stupid spacesuit? You're acting like a child, like things like that. And to me, that I, I get it because that's obviously something that I wanted to be childish. I wanted it to be playful and youthful. And that's how the art project was. It was this man child in a spacesuit running around doing crazy, ridiculous things. Um, but translating that into the educational aspect was maybe a little bit, maybe off-putting for some people. And just to err on the side of caution and to make sure that um, the information that I'm trying to teach people isn't behind a you know a character and isn't uh, hidden behind uh, what some people would call a, a gimmick, uh, I, I found to be more important than um, than maintaining the spacesuit look and. I honestly really enjoy the the way the channel's gone lately. I feel like it's a lot more professional, a lot more, um, I'm just focusing more on the content, less about like the gimmicks, I guess, uh, for myself. Uh, I take more pride in the work now. Um, so looking at an old video of me shooting it in a spacesuit, that's how old this video was. It was like shot last June, talking about how they're going to catch a fairing with, uh, with at the time, Mr. Steven. I mean, everything would have to be redone because of how much, it didn't even talk about the extending, they extended the arms, they, I mean, they recovered. For, so much has gone into that. I do want to talk about that someday. Uh, but at this point, that's kind of taken a wayside. Um, yeah, I, I don't I don't have any plans to do that anytime soon. I do have one particular question that I do want to answer in that video. And I could probably tweak the script and reshoot it. But um, yeah, I hope that you guys uh, don't mind. So, all right. Anyway. Um, long rant. Thank you for now. Uh, Zephyrox, are you planning a sit down interview with Elon? Of course. I, I, I think he knows that I want to do a sit down with him. Uh, it, guys, someday in the near future, I'm going to just do a final call out to try to get everyone to like retweet and, and let's, let's see if we can't get him to, uh, you know what I want to do? I want to challenge him a f totally fun, silly challenge. I want to, I want to hear, I think he's such a big space nerd. I really want to do like a quiz show where, um, everyone uh, asks ahead of time really good high quality space questions and we sit down and we go head to head on just general space trivia about different missions you know maybe what was the most something something mission um, yeah and, and just kind of go I think that would be a fun way to interview him and, and talk with him and and just get to know his, his knowledge of space because he's doing such a good job of answering questions on Twitter these days that it's uh, it's it's absurd. I, I feel like I've learned almost everything I could ever learn short of <laughs> sitting down and just having a, a conversation with him. So let's get him into an interview someday, but um, I'll let you guys know when, and then let's see if we can make that happen. But uh, yeah, uh, I would love that. Uh, Leah Grant, thank you for staying up to cover this launch. You're welcome. Uh, thanks for hanging out. Uh, and Tizwig, TFC, final super chat. I made it. Tim, video idea, why America should increase funding on space exploration. That's another good topic that, uh, yeah, I mean, it is a top-down question, but it's it's such an opinion piece. I really want hard, uh, it's not really an opinion. I mean, there's a lot of facts behind it, but I, I wish I could show you guys my list of video ideas. It's literally like two, uh, not 200. It's like 75 videos, though, that I'm trying to get through. And it just keeps, new stuff comes up all the time. So adding something to that list makes me kind of sick. <laughs> but yeah. All right. Thank you, guys. I'm going to I'm gonna go ahead. I'm going to do a full-blown uh, outro. One more friendly reminder. If you guys want a chance, um, these shirts are, again, limited time. So get your orders in right now, uh, everydayastronaut.com slash shop. If you want a chance to get some of these shirts before they sell out or utility pouches, some of the things that do sell out will not be restocked. Um, some of them will be restocked if, if it's a, an item that we just aren't done with yet. Um, so keep your eyes on this, uh, everydayastronaut.com slash shop. Again, this new full flow stage combustion shirt, I'm super excited. Um, these will ship mid-July. Uh, they have like an extra cool little sewn on patch and stuff. Just stepping it up just a little bit. I'm really excited for that. And again, also, uh, thank you again to my Patreon supporters and my Discord channel. You guys stayed up with me. I love you guys. 
some of you guys even were at the launch. Um, oh, Flo wants to know, of course, about the Starman hoodies. They're in the store. There's a little bit of an issue that happened in manufacturing that we're taking care of. These will be the death of me. Um, yes, I ordered thousands of dollars worth of Starman hoodies. Thousands of dollars worth of Starman hoodies, and I can't sell them yet. So patience on those. I'll tell you guys about it in Discord. <laughs> I'll tell you guys all about it. We'll do that tomorrow because I'm going to bed right now. So again, thank you to my Patreon supporters for uh, hanging out with me and for everything. And uh, lots more to come, so stay tuned. All right, guys, that's going to do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut bringing space down to Earth for everyday people. Great job, SpaceX. Huge, crazy roller coaster of a mission. Good luck on the rest of the mission tonight. I'm going to bed, though. I will see what happens in the morning. All right, adios. Bye, everybody.